since 1955, how many retired senior citizen men and women sitting on their porch in Iowa or Montana in their flannel shirt with nothing to win or nothing to lose years from death, look in the camera and say, I picked up recovered craft. I saw the bodies. I put a body in a crate. What I had been told by two different people was you didn't have to mentally ask the being the question. You would sit down as a telepath and in your mind, for lack of a better word, you would get, yes, I know you want to talk about the object that's in the Indian Ocean. We are no longer sitting on top of the food chain, that these beings are on top of the food chain. You know, they're the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, and we're the deer. They're extracting semen and ova from human beings like we do to animals. Sometimes the capture and tagging goes well. Sometimes it doesn't go well. And then, of course, in the last 10 years, there are so many examples of just blatant lies by the government. And it said, I am been commanded by someone higher than my CEO to cease and desist all contact with you. I am asking you, you are not to cut, drop, share this text message. You are no longer to contact me. You are now on a special government watch list due to your frequent and the nature of your FOIA requests, your overseas emails, and the nature of your questionnaire that you submitted to the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm here with John Stewart. He is a former candidate for governor of Illinois, and he ran for Senate. He's also the premier investigator of the, and I believe it is the 97 alien interview. Um, super interesting uh, interview. So check it out. My buddy, who is a big believer in um, aliens, alien abductions, uh, it really any conspiracy at all, he, he loves. And, you know, the, the problem is, since the you know advent of the internet and let's say the last 15 years is that growing up i would hear these you would hear these conspiracies and of course you know you shrug them off or even if there's a lot of evidence you still right. pretty much shrug them off because why would the government lie to us and and then of course in the last 10 years there are so many examples of just blatant lies by the government. You know, no, we would never spy on American citizens. There is no spy program. Six months later, a year later, there is a pro spy program. <laughs> we are spying on the American citizens. We would never citizens. kill or, you know, put habeas corpus on the side and Obama, you know, sends a Hellfire missile into a U.S. citizen's car in the Middle East. You know, right. It, no, no, no yeah. jury, no read him as no Miranda rights, no uh, trial by his peers, just, you know, and then kill his son two weeks later, American right. citizens. Well, I mean, so my problem with that is that like growing up, you know, I love a good alien abduction story. I, I, I loved fire in the sky. You know, yeah. I love the concept. I love the idea of it. I love the idea of Star Trek. Right. I love, you know, obviously you know, uh, those are, those are great, but deep down, I've just, I was always like, come on, stop it. And, and I would say, look, you know, I would do, do the whole, you know, semi mocking, like, you know, come on, where, where are the pictures? Where are this? Where's that? But the problem is as things have progressed, there are so many of these, what were, you know, crazy conspiracy theories that are being, you know, debunked that it's, it's at the point where, it's like, I, I'm still kind of like, where are the photos? Where are the videos? But, right. um, you know, the, the problem is, is that it, I also think that there's it, the availability for the government to suppress these things is just massive. So, and anyway, you know, I don't know. I, I, I do like the idea of it. I just really do would love to see concrete evidence i don't know that we'll ever get that but i my understanding is you've done a thorough if you want to see photos let's start let's you know let's rock and roll 
Right. What, what is this? I, I look at his mouth yeah. open, his mouth closed. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, so they're out there. You have to look. I, I, I say one thing. I give the the best uh, wrap up on, on what you just said. I, I, I think I, I've, I've worked at it since 1955. How many retired senior citizen men and women sitting on their porch in Iowa or Montana in their flannel shirt with nothing to win or nothing to lose years from death, look in the camera and say, I picked up recovered craft. I saw the bodies. I put a body in a crate. I flew the bodies to Fort Worth air base. Right. I worked at Wright Pat. I saw a bean. I, um, you know, I, uh, Bill Luhaus, a Marine, uh, I designed the simulator, uh, uh, an extraterrestrial simulator to train us pilots who worked alongside me was a J rod, uh, a, an extraterrestrial biological entity. You know, this guy's smoking his Marlboros with his flannel shirt on. And how many of the seven, 800 men and women who have come forward again, find salt of the earth people to tell you this is real and they're covering up. How many more people does it take? I don't know. Uh, frankly, I'm exasperated. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, I think we finally have seen light people poke through that disclosure tunnel. Certainly yesterday with David Grush's and Congress's testimony and hearings where we wanted to get to the bottom of aliens and UFOs. And about 20 times it was said, uh, Congresswoman, I will tell you that in private. Congressman, I can tell you that, but only in a skiff room. Uh, Congressman, I'll tell you that, but off camera, you know. Um, it just, just this whole thing continues to mock our loyalty and belittle our citizenship. And I really mean that. And I'm not a anti-government guy. I'm not an anti-military military guy, but the people are getting fed up. So well, let's, let's go back a little bit. What is your, sure. your background? You know, you know where, I, you, uh, where were you born? Grew, sure. Grew up in Chicago, uh, born in 1967, seventies kid. I tell everybody that Chicago television completely made me, you know, uh, a little goofy and a little crazy. You know, um, we had the, you know, we had a, a, a show, a kid's show where a guy, you know, molded clay and the clay, clay mound talked. I watching Dick the Bruiser pro wrestling on Sundays and Captain Kangaroo, a guy that came on with the dictators jacket on, uh, watching Evil Knievel, uh, you know, stock car racing. You know, I, I mean, it was just a TV totally changed my 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 perception and, and view of life. I was a college uh, football player for University of Memphis. I left that to become a professional wrestler at 19, still in college. Um, I did. I was a professional wrestler on and off for 20 years. My biggest mainstay was on ESPN for the AWA. Uh, many of my matches are on um, are on the are on YouTube. Uh, you know, wrestled everybody, and you know, my biggest rivalry was Sergeant Slaughter. Um, and, and that was, that was a great time and, uh, got out of wrestling and started in the family car business. Uh, we uh, had an automobile dealership and in between all of that, got married, three lovely children, um, still married and, uh, and ran for Congress in 99, uh, ran for Illinois governor in 2016. And then, uh, it was a replacement candidate for the libertarian party for Illinois secretary of state which I had no intention of running anymore. And that was, um, that was last year. And, and I did run for Senate. Um, and then the, the uh, uh, Illinois uh, Republican party said I needed $5 million. This was to go against Barack Obama. And they told Chicago bears football coach, Mike Dick, uh, you need 5 million. John Stewart needs 5 million or don't even think about running. And six, six weeks later, they, they pick Alan keys. Who's, you know, was a crazy man. Uh, to fill the uh, vacancy to run as a candidate. And uh, that's when I left, became a libertarian. And in um, 2019, Matthew, when I uh, had my first time off, that wasn't due to injury or vacation. I am a self-admitted and I don't, I'm not proud of it. Um, workaholic. I had some time off and my, you know, was my conscious or just like my interest, my alpha male said, you know, that video that has always bothered you since 1997 why don't you go figure out something about it you got four hours today let's go figure out something about it and that is when again in 2019 i put the pedal to the metal and started an investigation a self-funded uh totally journalistic uh, credibility and 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 methodology to study this film 
who simply find if it was real or a hoax. And if it was a hoax, did Hollywood do it or the government do it? Hmm. I don't think a lot of people expected me to say the government, but they do do magic, it's called. Um, and that's when I started the deep dive into this into this completely bizarre uh, film, uh, this two-minute, 56-second film of a, a leg- uh, alleged interrogation, a thought project- projection, questioning, I like to say, I don't like interrogation, of an off-planet being, an EBEN, E-B-E-N, extraterrestrial biological entity. And for five years, with the help of military intelligence insiders, with the help of uh, uh, UFO experts, uh, with the help of ordinary American people, I, I believe, um, with all journalistic uh, credibility, that I have solved the provenance uh, of this film. Okay, when was the first time you saw the film? It was 97. And I tell everybody, and I don't try to impress people. I'm trying to impress upon you why this has grabbed me. Uh, Matt, I'm living in downtown Chicago, high rise. I'm dating this beautiful, sexy blonde who's my wife now, 23 years later. Driving a black Porsche. I got a boat on Lake Michigan. I'm wrestling part time. Uh, I'm an automobile dealer, wholesaling, exporting, you know, just this crazy, exciting life. I'm running for state rep in Illinois. Also my first four way into politics. And this, this documentary comes on, you know, alien interview. And I'm thinking, well, it's going to be like a weird looking human handing a clipboard over to a general at the Pentagon on a closed circuit camera, you know, interview. And I see it, you know, 20 minutes into the documentary, I see this unprofessional non Hollywood produced continuous three minute shot of a gray alien. Here's the problem. It's not gray. It's tan. It doesn't have the gray almond eyes. It's got round eyes. The mouth is moving, opening and closing, just this little slit, which I thought even back then, uh, animatronically, to do it that fast would have been really, really hard. The two doctors come in when this being becomes in distress. They come in in short sleeve scrubs and mask and gloves on. You know, if I was hoaxing this, I'd have them in biocontainment suits. And, I'm, and then there's two shadows, two people in the foreground that are sometimes getting their shoulders in the camera angle. I'm like, this is either the worst hoax on planet Earth or it's so bad that it's got to be, there's got to be some provenance that this is authentic. And um, when you hear Victor, this is the whistleblower that came forward to this video production company and said, look, I've got this three minute film. I'm a former government employee. I was down in this facility. Um, I want to expose what's called the alien interrogation and retention program. Here's the video. You know, they interviewed him. And on top of everything else, this this I've never heard someone speak more intelligently in my life. He makes a statement that you know, do, do we get a lot of information from these beings, you know, from at night, from 97 and back? And he says, you know, minor technical, you know, uh, it, bits and pieces of information. And the communication is hard because the aliens are about 10,000 years advanced than us. And they're trying to uh, they're trying to thought projection their views or, or the, the, the modalities of physics and and gravity uh, to to us and we just have our own uh, conception of of physics and he says it's like putting uh calculus into the greets and the gre- screets and grunts and and groans and 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 growls of a chimpanzee how, you know, it's it, this you know and and how how advanced these beings are it's like us handing a cd rom and a cd player to somebody in 1820 you know they would hear the music and think it was magic and that's about how these beings have come across to to us. He says that it's that it's at the the whole program is one big ego deflation for the scientists that they can't understand these concepts that you know they thought they knew everything about physics physics and propulsion and gravity and and uh, and um, and space and time and you know they they can't even grasp the concepts most of them of the beings and it's a huge ego deflation. And uh, one thing I always forget to talk about is that there was a small cabal of people inside this facility. The facility is called S2 Alpha, and it was uh, the site 2 Alpha, and the, uh, the A is for Annex, Annex 2. This is where this alien retention and interrogation program took place. 
And he said the 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 security measures were so draconian. And we heard this from Bob Lazar, whether Bob was down there or not. I don't know. We heard this from a, a, a century guard who came forward a year before Bob Lazar, that it was just the security was like so draconian, so over the top. Um, and this cabal of five people conspired together in Las Vegas, um, you know, out because this facility was located about 10 miles uh, south of Area 51, to sneak out some sort of data, whether it be material, uh, photos, uh, reports, or film. And the film is what they actually snuck out, and also a dossier called the United States Government's um, uh, uh, um, uh, the United States Government's uh, Examination of Extraterrestrial Life, huge docket, which has never surfaced, but this film did. And, and uh, Jeff Broadstreet, the director of the documentary, spent three weeks vetting Victor to see if he was a Hollywood actor. And 25 years later, the director still tells everybody, look, we didn't hire this guy. We didn't make up this video. You know, and, and Jeff eloquently says, explain to me how a retired government employee that didn't drive on a government pension in 96 because that's when he came to the, to right. the office. How did he make a $150,000 production, hire animatronic experts and, 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 you know, craft catering and rent the, the stage to shoot all this. How did a government scientist on a retired pension, it didn't drive. How did he accomplish that? I, you know, that just, that just doesn't seem real. And it's the Occam's razor. The simplest explanation, of all of this is that the government filmed it. This film was cleverly taken out of Area 51, and I know how now, and I will get into that. And um, when he retired and thought he was clear enough or cleared enough from this facility and who he was, he released the film on uh, through Rocket Pictures on the UPN network, not Fox, on a, on a series called Strange Universe, and this was a one-hour documentary. And I think because of the alien interview, which somebody, you know, what people are saying was a hoax a year before this film. And because of its bizarreness fell through the cracks in the government in news uh, and in UFO researchers. So how, so you, you decided to contact the producer. Is that. Oh, I, through my five-year investigation, I probably have written 180 press releases. I've tried to contact 60 reporters I'm at right now 45 ufologists, uh, seven military experts, four, four uh, who helped me deeply. I, Three of these I, military I, people are military intelligence retired insiders. Been contacting with the producer, the CEO of the production company, and it's just this casual conversation of it's not fake. We okay. didn't fake it. We didn't hire Victor. He came okay, to well, us out of the blue. All right. So. He came to them. You reached out. What was the first your first process? I understand everything you're trying to kind of consolidate in five minutes, but we have more than five minutes. What? So yeah. what, what was the so what was the first, you know, what was your first step? You saw it, you said, ah, let me take a look at this thing. You started that process by contacting who? Okay. Great question. So this bizarre physiological monitor, if I, if you're going to show the film is behind, by this creature, the blip does not go across the screen. It goes up and down and stays stationary. Never seen that before. We still don't know what that is. It's the only part of my investigation that I, that I really have not had any conclusive information about. And also on the bottom of this film is digital overlay graphics placed on the film itself later in production or when they made two copies at the Groom Lake Photo Lab. It says DNI slash uh, 27, uh, uh, Delta, November, India, um, which Victor tells us stands for the Department of Naval Intelligence. Just remember that. And then slash 27. So I've got this film in my mind. It's 1999, and I run for United States Congress. I drop out and endorse a man who became the congressman and an Illinois senator. And he had a senator, a uh, present sitting senator on our bus tour when I dropped out and we went around the end of the campaign to help him, you know, the end of the uh, end of the cycle of the election. And I asked this senator who was a former Navy person, and I'm sure people can, you know, put two and two together. And I don't want to say his name anymore because I've been admonished for doing so. 
And when he got off the stage to make a speech, we took a picture and I looked at him. I said, you know, Senator, before we get back on the bus, what is the Department of Navy Intelligence? And Matthew, he looked, this jovial senator, senator got this aggressive look, stared at me with these black coal eyes. He's like, you don't need to know anything about that. Stormed off to talk to me for the rest of the bus tour. And I do wrap-ups. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. I got a hoax video, right? Supposed hoax video. Three letters on the hoax video that a screenwriter, 24-year-old screenwriter in 1996 put on to hoax us. We can't find what the Department of Naval Intelligence is, 96 or 2023. So why would you put a department that no one can find? I mean, you're hoaxing yourself. And why did these three letters, I'm saying this in my mind, piss off a United States senator? And I remember saying to myself, sitting alone on the bus, what in the hell is going on with this video? And then normal life takes over, Matt. I... Uh, and it's the start of COVID again. Like I said, I had some time off and I said, let me figure something out about this film. And I, and this is 2019. And I started with the physiological monitor folks. It looked like a pane of glass with this green blip going up and down stationary, not horizontally across the monitor. Bizarre. So trying to be a good journalist and investigator, I find three PhD candidates who did the history of physiological monitors. I mean, is there anybody better to go to to get right. their opinion on what is this? Um, and they looked at the film and these three PhD candidates said, you know, Mr. Stewart, we have no idea what that is. We've never in all of our years of, of, of research, we have never seen that, heard of that. It doesn't make sense that the blip goes up and down and not across the screen. And we are to tell you that we have no idea what that monitor is. That wasn't enough. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be a good journalist. I call Hewlett Packard and Space Labs. They were the two companies in the 90s that made physiological monitors for uh, retail consumption and Space Labs made it for NASA. You know, right? These great companies to call. And I literally asked for their physiological monitoring engineering departments, research and development. And one of them emailed me back, said, we, we're all here looking at your film in, 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 in engineering we have no idea what this is. We've never seen this even at a trade show. We've never seen concept drawings of this. And I'm thinking PhD candidates don't know what this is. The engineers at Hewlett Packard don't know what this is. I get a crusty 60 something year old guy at Space Lab. Um, I'm sorry, Space Lab sent me the, we don't know what it is. I get a crusty 60 something year old guy at Hewlett Packard. And, um, and he's calling me kid, you know. And I show him the video and he's like, kid, I don't know what that is. I said, sir, have you ever seen this at a trade show in 30 years of being a physiological engineer? Have you ever heard of somebody say we could, we could try and develop this or a, a single blip that goes up and down? He goes, you're not listening to me. I don't know what this is. He goes, but I'm telling you, if you're telling me this is in a government lab or a government facility, it could be a one of. And I'm like, oh, what's a one of? He said, well, in any application, scientific, let's say you're trying to figure out a situation, a, solve a, a problem, a formula, you would develop, and there was no device to help you, let's say like a metal detector, if you're looking for gold in the ground, you would develop and, 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 and put to concept, con conceive and develop and manufacture a one-of device, just one of a kind to help you figure out your situation. I said, don't laugh at me. I said, would you develop a one of physiological monitor if you knew that a bean had a really bizarre heart and lung sac and not a traditional heart and lung? First time, and this has happened a lot for five years, didn't laugh at me, Matthew. He didn't hang up on me. He didn't, you know, you know, cough and be like, oh, dear God. And he went, yeah, that's exactly what I would have done if this was an alien and he didn't have a regular human heart. Of course, you'd have to make up a special device. So again, I'm I'm sitting in my car and I'm going, hmm. Okay, we've got a pissed off senator. We've got a department, Navy intelligence. Nobody knows what it is. I've got a strip mall video production company. You know, listen to my words, folks. A strip mall video production company that is somehow magically invented the most bizarre physiological monitor ever known to man and an animatronic doll 
that probably would have cost what we were told 70 to $100,000 back then, five people to work it. And we know that the budget that they got from the UPN network and Strange Universe to put this one hour documentary on was just over $100,000. And we know what Victor was paid. We know what Jeff Broadstreet basically was paid. How did this happen? No money, a retired scientist uh, who doesn't drive, this monitor, the pissed off senator, uh, the department that doesn't exist. And here I am in 2019, Matthew, I'm sure you've had moments like this that any of your other viewers, when you're trying to figure out something, you, you sit back and you go, my God, what am I getting into? What this, this is no longer some semi-retired grandfather's hobby. You know, I'm starting to fall down the rabbit hole. And I, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going and, and, and go further and, and try and find even more about this video. Okay. But you still hadn't contacted the producer or the, no, sorry. No, no, it's right. So mm. I had now, I had information, but I did not have knowledge. You know, knowledge is from people being in dealing with it. First person, you know, uh, first person witnessing this, maybe this program, Matthew, I knew no one really in the UFO community. I know no, nobody in military intelligence, and barely in the military. But I knew that some UFO researchers, when they published books or they did radio interviews, would get contacted sometimes from people in the know and, and with their desire to help out that UFO researcher. So I went on the Jeff Rents program. Jeff has had and still has a very uh, 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 alternative news website, uh, reminiscent of Drudge. Um, he's got a, a, a radio, uh, internet radio show. So in 2021, I went on the Jeff Rents program and talked about where I was at with the monitor and the senator and so on. And lo and behold, about, about uh, uh, a, a, it was the first week of June. This was in right before Memorial Day. I get an email from a gentleman, claims to be, a, you know, a, a, an insider. And he says, you know, I, I enjoyed your interview. You got some things right. Got a couple of things wrong. You know, I'd like to keep in touch with you. Um, if you have any questions, um, you know, you might think of for me if I can help you or any, and I'll never forget the word. He said, if I, if I can nudge your investigation in any way, please, please let me know. I don't know how much I can tell you, um, but I'll do my best. And I would get emails minute, from him the first Wait, week who, who of every this? month. Sorry. Who was this again? Sorry. I'm sorry. After doing this, this Jeff Rents program, right. I got a random email from, I don't know who it was at this okay. point. Okay. So you know, seemed okay, to me you know. like a mail. Um, right. and, and, uh, you know, he said, I, you know, I caught your program, you know, I'm in the know, um, I'm not with military intelligence, but you know, I have been read into these programs. Like I said, I'll help you if I can and give your investigation a nudge. And, and, you know, wow, you got some things right. You got a couple of things wrong, what you were talking about. Right. Did, and, did you ever figure well, out who the, that was? Well, I, I, I will tell you, I can't oh, reveal his okay. name because he is Sorry. my deep throat. Like, you know, okay. Woodward and Bernstein and the Watergate investigation. It was, um, he did this, uh, communicate with me, uh, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, for 10, for 10 months. And on my birthday, he sends me the list, and I don't want to mince my words here. He sends me the list of the report from the Defense Intelligence Agency. That is who ran the alien and interrogation program south of Area 51, the DIA. He must have had a contact in the DIA who sent him a, and this is my vernacular, like in an internal investigation for the director of the DIA back in either 91 or 97 when this video surfaced of, you know, how this video film was smuggled out. But more importantly, I got the names of the military men who were in the viewing gallery watching this alien interview through the partition glass. And it, it was shocking to me. My hand was shaking because I was seeing people's names that I've never seen before, that I never heard of in ufology. 
And he told me the real date of the film, which the whistleblower Victor got wrong. Um, the name of the facility, which was S2 Alpha, Vic Victor said it was S4. We know that the bottom level of S2 Alpha is called S4. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, promotion about that on the Internet. Um, and and so it also said that it wasn't smuggled out in the butt crack of Victor in a microfilm that the United States Air Force cameraman simply took this film when the interview was finished with this bean. He was driven back to the Groom Lake photo lab, not Area 51 photo lab, the Groom Lake photo lab by a United States Air Force police officer. Wouldn't you have liked to have been in that car for the 15 minutes to Area 51? Um, uh, and, and three days later, not that day, real specifics, three days later, Two copies of the film were made, and the three-minute version was put into a United States government burn bag. I don't even know what the GSA was at the time, and it was the burn bag that was let out of Area 51 and then recollected um, by the U.S. Air Force cameraman, not Victor. So there's a new person in this whole fold, which is the Air Force cameraman really smuggled this out, and Victor was the one that simply went on camera. <clears throat> But Matthew, you know, just having the names, it's not any kind of an investigation. So I started to process and 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 dig into each one of the names. Again, these are the men that were viewing the bean behind the viewing partition in the interview suite down at level S4 in S2 Alpha building. And the first name uh, was a retired Air Force person, famous son of a World War II veteran, not MacArthur, not Patton, not Eisenhower. And he was on the Wikipedia, it said he was, he worked, he then worked for TRW. I'm like, well, this is a hoax. The guy wasn't even in the Air Force at the time. He was being allowed to watch, to view this alien. And then I called Sean David Morton, who was instrumental in the, in the first documentary as a researcher. He said, John, my family, Are you gonna, some you're of gonna, my family you're worked you're for TRW. Name? Sean David Moore. Oh, and okay. he said, TRW does so many black projects for the government. They might as well be the government. That does not disqualify him. If anything, that even proves even more of a provenance of why he might have been down there. Interesting. Okay. You know, still to this day, no one's hope, no one's debunking this thing for me. The next person was a rear admiral. I look him up and to my shock, he was the intelligent, listen to me, folks, the intelligence liaison for the Joint Chiefs of Staff reporting directly to Colin Powell. This is 91. And Who he was that? in the Oval Office with Colin Powell briefing the president of the United States, George H. Bush at the time. He is dead and he was the he is the only name I'm going to release. His name was uh, Admiral Schaefer. His uh, nickname was Ted. And he was uh, allegedly down in this facility also. But remember what he did. He was intelligence liaison for the Joint Chiefs and for Colin Powell, brief the president. Very important you remember that in about 20 minutes from now. The next person was a captain in naval intelligence, a Wikipedian. He retired a vice admiral. I'm like, well, this is a hoax. They said he's a captain. Uh, one of my investigators, Chris Jackson, former police officer, he's like, dummy. <laughs> me tell me this this um investigation uh uh briefing was either from 91 was from uh, it was was taken from information in 91 do you think maybe back in 91 he was an army a united states navy captain and 25 years later he became an admiral and i'm like oh my god that's true that that this list is from 91 not from 2023. So uh, I find his email. I email him. And we have this great relationship, three or four e emails. It was actually three because the fourth one is when he goes to me. Three emails back and forth. Matthew, I was actually going to go to Virginia and, you know, ask him out for lunch or for coffee or I don't know what do retired military people do, play golf. But this is how friendly we were with each other. He asked me to, I, I almost gave him his nickname. He asked me to call him his nickname, which felt very uncomfortable for me. And, it, and at the fourth email, he said, you know, you know, before you come out, 
what do you have? What is this documentary about? And I'm like, you know, uh, vice admiral, this is very hard for me. You know, I have relatives in the military. I respect the military. You know, I'm proud to say that I was one of the progenitors with Senator Mark Kirk, who kept the North Chicago VA uh, uh, administration center open when we found out it was being closed. So please take that as a grain of salt, but I'm going to send you a report. Your name's on it. It's as bizarre as it gets. And please let me know what you think. And this friendly guy with these friendly interactions ghosted me, refused to e email me back, call, call me, anything, completely ghost me. And in my opinion, Matthew, in 2022, if you're electronically ghosting somebody after such a nice, you know, camaraderie of emails, that says that speaks volumes. That's saying a million words. I've talked to military people. You know, most people in the military, you know, people on the internet want me to say most, not all. And that's true. Most people in the in the military are very honorable. And they're not gonna lie to your face. And instead, what they'll do, they just won't talk to you. So they're not forced to lie. So he it just refused to talk to me. Uh, about eight months later, a month ago. Dr. Michael Sala, who runs ExoPolitics, he was a, you know, a government, a litigator for countries and, and just a, you know, PhD, uh, just a wonderfully bright man. He emailed him and the, and the vice admiral e e emailed back and said, you know, I'm just not interested in talking anything about my past military career. And Dr. Sala wrote me back and said, I can't believe it. He's, he's real. He's legit. It's a real person. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing. And so I'm like, wow, this is, you know, this, this is getting creepier by the day. You know, again, nobody just debunking it. This is the really two interesting parts. Then it comes to the doctors who came in to the beans area to tend to the bean when it was having a respiratory attack, a coughing attack. And I Googled both of their names, the doctor to the beans right on the film who's hold, just holding his shoulder, the bean shoulders. He died in California about five years ago. I find Matthew, his widow, his second wife, who is his widow. I call her up. Now imagine telling an 80 year old woman, you know, uh, I think your husband was involved in aliens. Like, can you imagine? It's like, it was really uncomfortable for me, but I told her the entire story quickly. And I don't get hung up on, she's not laughing. And there's a pause. And I'm not being melodramatic. I'm just relating this verbatim. And she said, John, the light just went on above my head. I'm like, what? She's like, this completely makes sense now. And I'm like, I, I'm going to call her Kim. I'm like, Kim, can you explain what you're talking about? She said, John, ever since I've been married to my husband, he's never wanted to talk about his time in the United States Army Medical Corps. Now, I never said Army Medical Corps. That is on this report from the DIA. It's Dr. So-and-so, United States Army Medical Corps. So how did this 80-year-old woman know what was going to be on this report describing what her husband was or the branch of military? Interesting. She said he never wanted to talk about his time in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. She goes, John, what's even more funny, our friend group, our social group, has veterans from Vietnam, Korea, World War II, and they all talk of funny stories of a drill instructor or, you know, the conditions at boot camp or, you know, non-combat humorous stories. And we all would ask ourselves and to each other, why does my husband never want to talk about his time in the military? What, what secret or secrets was my husband holding on to? And she said, this phone call after 20 years makes complete sense. And I really appreciate you call me and if you have anything else, my daughter, you know, you said you live in the Chicago area. My daughter lives in the Chicago suburbs. Here's her name. Here's her email. You know, if you ever want to get together and coffee and ask her about my husband, you know, please do so. And she goes, I'm going to tell her what you told me and, you know, do what you want with it. I'm like, wait a minute. Some, some unknown person sends me this list. I start vetting it. No one's laughing. No one's hanging up the phone. You know, like, you know, I knew I was in, I knew I was in deep at that point. Here's another bizarre one. The next doctor. I find out in 1991 that he was working for the VA. Not that the VA has the best doctors in the world, but 
working for the VA, I would think it's like being on the bench as a pitcher in baseball for the government. You know, you can be plucked out at any time and, and moved anywhere for any need. And remember, the creature in this video film has a coughing respiratory attack. What did this doctor do in the VA in 1991? He was a pulmonologist. Now, that's that's either the greatest coincidence, you know, pulmonology, dealing with breathing, yeah. lungs. And they must have brought this, this doctor in because the creature was suffering from a debilitating respiratory issue. Victor tells us that even though they eliminated microbial bacteria from their ecosystems, that's a verbatim quote, that they still were susceptible to having microbes form. And for biologists, I'm butchering this, still form in the respiratory system no matter how advanced and how high tech these beings were. And this doctor must have been brought in um, as a pulmonologist and an expert to see if he could figure out how to, you know, treat or care for this being. He is still practicing medicine in Connecticut and his pictures on the internet with his lab coat on and his office hours. And, you know, it, you know, you're seeing a man tend to an alien from off planet and now you're seeing his picture on, you know, Google. It, it was bizarre. It, it was bizarre. And then it said there was two other telepaths in the room. And let me talk about the tele telepathy program. It was actual thought projection. What I had been told by two different people was you didn't have to mentally ask the being the question. You would sit down as a telepath and in your mind, for lack of a better word, you would get, yes, I know you want to talk about the object that's in the Indian Ocean. I really don't know much about it. And, you know, before you could say to the being in your mind, can you tell me about the object in the Indian Ocean? And another anecdotal story that I got from, from a military insider was the communication was difficult. And this is a great anecdotal story. Um, you know, you want to call bullshit, that's great. But this is a, I thought this was a really interesting anecdotal story of the communication barrier. The telepath would get the thought of, do you know where I'm coming from? And, and he would turn to an army or a Navy or an intelligence person in the room and say, he's asking us, you know, do we know where he comes from? I guess that's like a star system. When in fact, or, or, or sorry, I'm, I'm jumbling that. The telepath would say, he's asking me, do you know where I'm coming from? Like he's getting like snippy with me. When in fact the being would, was, was relating, do you know where I come from? What star system, what right. galaxy or what, you know, what, what moon or what, um, you know, what part of the universe that I come from? So there was a very, very, very hard um, communication uh, uh, problem with the telepaths and these beings, uh, but it was told that these two telepaths that were in the room and in that interview were remarkable. They would be, they were able to sit down with this being and immediately turn around. And I'm imitating what a military person was showing me. They would be able to turn around immediately and say, okay, his spaceship was designed and built at a molecular level. It's not like where we do where we layer metal and do rivets. And, you know, they would get immediate, immediate, clear, definitive um, uh, information from these beings. Um, it was remarkable, but many people, including Victor, said that the telepath program, they were hiring people and get, getting telepaths that were one step above 1-800 psychics, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. And this is not something I would like to, 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 to pivot. Something that relates with Bob Lazar and another person named Dan, Danny Bush, Captain Danny Burrish, who is claim to be down in the facility. The government loves people who are a little off. Their education is sketchy. Um, they have an interesting background. They can't prove a lot of the provenance of their education or their, their, uh, their profession or their expertise. And why? So when they come out and expose things, they can debunk them. All right. They're and easily. When I just said to you, look at myself. I'm not a government plant. I mean, my daughters spit up their cocoa puffs at the table when I said somebody on the internet says I'm a CIA agent. You know, um, but but have I been used 
and debrief to get this information out? It's possible. And look at me, you know, went to six colleges in my professional wrestling career. I had a Ric Flair gimmick with the boa sequin robe. I was an automobile dealer and a politician. Could you pick any more professions that people laugh at? So look at who, to some degree, a portion of the government is letting the information come to and letting this person now being the figurehead of this video. You know, I am completely um, can be just discredited my education and and who I was in my crazy life and lifestyle back in the day. So right. this is not an uncommon Hello? thing for the, for the government to do. Not right. uncommon to, to pull. Can you hear me? You know, and a psychic and say, "Hey, do you want to think you can?" You know, do telepathy through an alien. I see you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Having a hard time so, hearing you. Oh, I hear they, you now. Okay. They choose people that are easily discredited. Got yes, it. Yes, sir. So that's my here's, point. Here's one of my uh, questions for you. You say you've got the list. You were sent a list, but the only person's name that you're willing to release is someone who's deceased. Do you see how that's that, that how that's problematic? Totally. And let me follow that up. Okay. Seven UFO researchers that I trust have this list. Okay. I, the minute I got it, I drove to Wisconsin and I met the Roswell expert. He was J. Allen Hynek of Blue Book's assistant in Chicago. His name is Donald Schmidt. Um, he is currently right now in New Mexico looking for more metal from the Roswell crash. He's head of the International UFO Consortium. The, day, the, the, the weekend I got it, I drove to show it to him. Remember, I don't want to be Bernie Madoff. I don't want to be Elizabeth Holmes. Disclosure. And yes, um, we are still, and, and two other reasons, that this is keeping the list not public. Number one, um, we are filming a documentary. It's not out yet. I have no agreements. So, you know, th that is part, you know, that is part of my, my, um, you know, my material that I would like to present in, in my way. The second biggest problem is we still don't know the legality of what I have in bringing out these people's names. I don't want this doctor's office to be sieged with vans and satellite trucks and UFO people calling them. This is a very m murky and very sticky situation that I'm in. But I want everyone to know, I'm looking in the camera, seven UFO experts, two law firms, two producers, and two people inside a Naval Intelligence who are on this list have this report. So I didn't hide this from anyone, from anyone. And, and I am willing to show, I call him the chairman. I'd like to get how I exposed to myself, the man that gave me this list. Um, I, I Anyone that wants to fly to Chicago, I will come face to face without any cameras. I'll show you his picture in the newspaper, who he is. You'll probably fall off your chair. He's a very prominent person in a metropolitan city. So, you know, nine people have this list. I, I want to be very clear to that. And respected UFO researchers. This list is with Congress, too, and Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project. Okay. So, you you went through, you spoke with everyone that was it was possible to speak with Correct. on the list. You were, essentially, you got some bits of information, but most, but some also just, were either deceased or they didn't want to speak anymore, but their titles and locations and everything connected with the list that you received. So 91. Yes. Yep. What was, what was your next step? Okay. Um, so I had a little break, you know, you, you got all this information, you showed the UFO researchers and experts, quality, trusted people. Um, you know, Linda Moulton, how, most respected person in ufology, a journalist, award-winning journalist, said, you got gold here. I said, why do I have gold? She's like, because I have never heard of one of these men. And sometimes fraudulent UFO people come forward with retread names. She's like, you're coming forward with people that we've never heard of, and they're verifiable through Wikipedia or Google or any kind of a search like that. So I'm looking at my emails from this, this man who got the DIA report for me. And I realized, Matthew, that he was emailing me the first week of every month. And it kind of sunk in because my father was on a board of directors for 35 years 
of a credit union in Illinois. And they met the first week of every month for a board of directors meeting. It's called the Open Meetings Act. And I said, I'm wondering if this person is on a board of directors. And then I, I uh, took his email. I should have done this 10 months ago. I just did it. I, you know, you're, you're in the moment. You're not thinking clearly. You know, I have ADD. I'm a, you know, I'm, I can be a dingling too and not think clear. I'm like, wait a minute. Why don't I try and back, you know, f- you know, try and find out what this email connects to. And I have a program through the automobile industry, believe it or not, that does that. And I found out that the email connected to an institution, I'm going to leave it at that, in a metropolitan city. And through my research, I called the number. It was this man's daughter's office that the email was coming from. And my speculation based on, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence is that when this man would come for a board of directors meeting once a month, he would go into his daughter's office and e- use her computer and email me. And I was pretty proud that I, you know, I did the uh, Colombo investigation and, and kind of realized that. And I actually spoke to her. But of course, I was, you know, I lied to her. I was, you know, didn't tell her exactly why I was calling. Uh, you know, I got her name. It's not the name. Uh, and that's why I call my main whistleblower the chairman, um, because he was on a board of directors in an institution in a metropolitan city. And, um, you know, so I, I had all this provenance and I said, well, what else can I do? Now, there was a man in Europe who d- dissected the video piece by piece and he found microscopic eyebrow movements. He found the mouth opening and closing. And so did journalist Jaime Musan in Mexico who emailed me, John, close up on the mouth. You know, you're going to fall off your chair. It opens and closes instantaneously, and it doesn't have any protruding animatronic metals or whatnot. So trying to know that I'm going to get vetted, I'm going to be asked, I'm going to, my investigation is going to be microscopically analyzed. I then paid $2,500, and my wife was not happy, to an animatronic expert in in California who was hire, hired by National Geographic to do a deep dive microscopic analysis of the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film. I mean, what better guy to take this to, right? If National right. Geographic trusts him. So I spent $2,500. I gave him the film. He immediately, three days later, writes, sends me back a picture of the monitor. And the monitor, because an FX person told us, well, it's a pane of glass. They're bouncing a laser on it. Somebody off camera. He said, it's not a pane of glass. It's a device. It's a box. It's surrounded by metal. It's an actual monitor. I'm like, okay. Four days later, he writes me back and he's like, I got a head scratcher here. This is the man hired by National Geographic's pretty well-respected animatronics person and especially video expert in California. He said, John, I've been doing animatronic puppets for 30 years. Never, never in my life. And he sent me 20 pictures as examples. Have I seen an animatronic puppet where it does not have creases in the armpits, in the arm folds? And he said that happens because about 75% of the drying process. Folks, this is what I was told. It could be 80, half. Somebody could have a different technique. But some at some point in the drying process of an animatronic creature being, you have to hold up the creature where his arms come down to the side of his body. And I'm doing that with my, and he goes, and when the arms come down to the side of the, of the puppet's body, it is then the creases appear or, or are created from that movement. And he goes, I'm scratching my head. I spent a day staring at it. That alien does not have any creases in its arm fold. And I can't tell you for the life of me why. Now he goes, I can't say this is hundred percent. I don't have the a bean and formaldehyde. I don't know anyone that has this puppet on their shelf or in their garage in Hollywood. He said, but I'm telling you that arm crease, that is a massive, massive red flag that it is not an animatronic puppet. You know, so here I sit. Now I've got uh, an FX pes- expert telling me that there's a great possibility um, that, that this could be real. And, you know, I always tell people that this is the, um, you know, this is the investigation that keeps giving. Um, 
so I had all this nomenclature and I had all these names and facilities. And I know that he was a counterintelligence person, you know, 30 years ago. And he dissuades people that maybe it's a UFO, maybe it's a government program. And his name is Richard Doty, he works for the Air Force. And I just asked Richard Doty to break down the military nomenclature and just Wadayam to ask him about the film, you know, because somebody, and I'm not calling Richard this at all, but because somebody was in the mafia, do you not as a reporter want to still interview them, even though they may have lied and murdered or again, I'm not saying that that is Doty, but the point being is just because somebody has done something checkered or eyebrow raising in the past, doesn't mean that that's that person in present day. And Doty said, you know, I said, Rich, do you know if this Victor film is real? He's like, it is absolutely real. He goes, but Victor was lying. I'm like, oh, here we go. It's going to be a, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to be debunked. He said, it wasn't at S4 technically. The level is called S4 that the interview suite is at. He said, but the building is called S2 Alpha, Sector 2 Annex. And that is where the alien retention interrogation program takes place. I'm like, okay. I said, um, can you can you tell me anything tell me anything else he said that um you know that uh that i can't believe that this that i'm what i'm about to say how these stories prove each other for two people that don't know each other he said john i don't know anything really else about the film i know that victor is it was a biologist i never said biologist he said, but I'll tell you one thing. I remember back in 96 in intelligence circles, because we gossip more than, you know, women at a PTA meeting. And I don't mean to be deg degrading towards women, but, you know, we gossip more than five guys at a, at a golf outing. Um, he goes, I remember the director of the documentary doing a deep dive and really having sharp elbows and pissing off intelligence people trying to figure out if Victor was indeed a government employee. Now think about that. Here's Rick Doty telling me a story from 25 years ago that the director who supposedly hired an actor, right? That's what the, the, the skeptics say that the director who supposedly hired an actor is vetting this actor in, in through military people and military intelligence sources and, and, and pissing people off. Why would you vet an actor that you hired through central casting? So again, another, you know, uh, uh, another anecdotal story from two people that don't know each other that crisscrossed and, and, and overlapped. I mean, man, it, it just, it just, it did never ended. You know, I go on the internet to the guy that does reverse speech, David Oates, regardless of whether you think of the science of reverse speech, you know, it takes your, takes a statement, then it plays it backwards and some ex extraordinary, you know, words come out relating to your subconscious. He starts debunking Bob Lazar, Richard Hoagland, the guy that does the Mars anomalies. And then we, and then I find where he does Victor. And I'm like, oh, here we go. You know, he's going to bust me. Victor's a fraud. And Victor in reverse speech says from the Pleiades. And then another party says in my head, meaning thought projection. And David Oates, the scientist for reverse uh, speech, um, says, quote, that in my opinion, the whistleblower Victor who brought out the alien interview is a highly credible, highly credible witness and says who he says he is. You know, this isn't part of my investigation. He, I didn't hire David Oates to, to, to you know, to, to prove the provenance uh, right. of my investigation. Uh, far be it. Um, and it came to the point where um, I know I'm missing something here. Um, you know, it came to the point where I found, I just couldn't find anyone to debunk it. And I want to be very clear, Matthew, in 25 years, not one credible person, the person that built the puppet, a person that worked on the catering for that day during that shoot, the two military men that were in the foreshadow, uh, anybody in the production, no one with any credibility in Hollywood or the government has come forward to say it's debunked. And this is exactly how I can tell you with proof that it's been debunked. Nobody in 25 years. You mean to tell me, uh, Matt, I know you're going to you're going to agree with me on this. You mean to tell me in 25 years, the guy that made the puppet 
isn't at a pool party in Calabasas trying to impress the Kardashian girls or you know some some girl trying to pick up some girl at a pool party and you know that 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 video of that alien I did the doll nobody can figure out how I did it and um you know even like last week we had a superimposed image of the film because people said well the aliens black eyes all oh, it's a piece of glass or just a glass ball we did a reverse imaging like an x-ray of the film you see the pupils of the eye in back of these black uh light reflection reflecting lenses because they're light sensitive of two eyeballs and you see the pupil getting bigger and smaller bigger and smaller as the to the torch light is shined in the eyes by the medic or it, it, it encounters the light that is above the beam. We have pupils dilating on this beam. Why would an animatronic person put eyeballs in back of black glass? Well, nobody's going to see that or, or realize that. You know, they wouldn't know that 25 years later, we could, we could prove that it was pupils. And when I had all of this information together, I vetted my sources and no one was coming forward. I took my investigation to Congressman Burchett. I flew to Washington, D.C. I handed this investigation, the, uh, the uh, internal report, all of the witnesses, the names, the provenance, um, who Victor was, what occupation he, he did. He was a biologist. And I handed it to Congressman Tim Burchett's office, who was running and ran the subcommittee hearings on the United States uh, government and UFO and UAP and alien a phenomenon, which was yesterday. And uh, this my, this investigation is submitted into the one gig tetrabyte document uh, packet from Dr. Stephen Greer. It's a part of the disclosure project. So, and hopefully um, I can, you know, have some sort of documentary where we come out with all these names. We go in even a deeper dive on all these names and bring forth some of the witnesses who would be willing to talk on camera and I can just kind of package this whole thing together and, um, and show the world that for lack of a better term, in my opinion, um, I have proven the second greatest question in mankind, you know, are we alone? No. And does the government know about it? Absolutely. Did you talk to the producer of the film? <clears throat> Tom Coleman was the CEO of Rocket Pictures. I don't know how many more times he could write and tell me on the phone or on Zoom, John, we did not hire this actor. We didn't produce that film. The director who did both documentaries, let me talk about the second documentary. If this is a, albeit for you, if this is a hoaxer, Victor, then he's the best one I've ever seen. But the director, Jeff Broadstreet, who did both documentaries, you know, he's almost like frustrated at this point. He's like, how many times can I tell you? Victor was a government biologist. He brought in this film. I didn't make up this production of an alien, of that alien you see in the film. Yes, they did a B-roll recreation alien to show people before they showed the real film. He said, I was not part, I do not know anyone that was part of that filming. And he goes, John, if it was, it's the worst filming ever. It's one shot. Uh, you know, the, 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 the two military men in the foreshadow, their shoulders come into to the view. People have asked, if, why, wasn't it, why wasn't it a three camera shot? They've had these beans since 1947. I was told by a military person and he, he pantomimed this for me. It's like, you know, oh, okay, the beans sitting down. Hal, do you have the camera ready? Okay, roll camera. All right, start asking questions. I don't mind to be disrespectful to these beans, but it's old hat by now. They didn't need a three camera shoot. They just needed, a, they needed to film this for documentation. It doesn't, just like to some degree, the alien autopsy, which could be a hoax. You're not there for a Hollywood production. You're just there to shoot and be a documentarian of what the action is going on, whether it's blurry or out of focus. And by the way, this was never out of focus, was never blurry. Nobody tried to dissuade you. And people have asked me, why is the room so dark? It wasn't dark in the original VHS tape. It was bluish, kind of grainy. The production company darkened the film for dramatic effect. And I know that probably wasn't the best thing to do, but I have. The, the, the film, it's bluish color. It's on YouTube. And it, it's shocking. You see the, the bean's arms. You see its chest. 
Um, this was not a darkened room to hide a puppeteer, believe me. So, and, okay. um, you know, so it's now, it's now with Congress and, you know, I'm hopefully will be called at some point in the future for a congressional hearing to tell what I, to tell what I know and tell the entire provenance, um, of the film. Now here's the other one in 08, 10 years later, Victor comes back for a second documentary. He's livid. Now, Matthew, listen to my words, because this is where I want you to mentally unpack this. If this is a, a charlatan, he comes back. He is livid. I risk my life, my career, my pension to help the UFO world and to tell the American people what is going on with the government. And not one UFO researcher has done any, this is an 08, has done any kind of a serious investigation of my film, of the, of the alien. Prove it's a puppet. Prove that it's real. Prove who I am. And Jeff Broadstreet, the director, says, well, many people in the UFO world, listen to this, many people in the UFO world believe that it's real. Victor gets pissed at that statement. He goes, I don't want people to take it at face value. That's all they're doing is taking it at face value. And these charlatans affects people, these egomaniacs that I could have built that. Victor says, well, build one. Build one that looks and moves exactly like that alien in the picture. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know many charlatans that come back out and go, come on, come on, come on, prove me wrong. Prove the film. And mad at people now, if I was a charlatan, I would say, yeah, people believe me. Here's who believe me. This guy is mad at the people that believe him because in his words, they're just taking it at face value. He said he's dying in the, in the, in the, in the second follow-up documentary. He says to look up where Donald Rumsfeld was on Easter of 1998. I did that through the Rumsfeld Foundation. He was having dinner in, in Taos, New Mexico, which is coincidentally the the nearby home of the Dulce base, which whether is real or not. Um, I did everything Victor asked, you know, where is the person that, that is going to do the deep dive on this and prove it right or wrong, authentic or hoax. And I did just that. And I just don't feel um, that a, a charlatan would come out and egg people on. And also what people don't understand right before the original documentary, Victor goes on the art bell program radio show unrehearsed, unscripted questions and sits there for an hour and a half. I've never heard someone speak this intelligently before in my life about the program, the people, the facility, the beans themselves. Um, it, it was remarkable. So if this guy's a charlatan, um, he, I tell you what, he wasn't a Hollywood actor. So who was this Victor who didn't drive, was retired in his late fifties, who brought out this hundred to $150,000 production of an alien being? And then comes back to challenge people that that right. doesn't pass the litmus test as being a hoax. All right. So here's my, my question, but what I'm, I must not, I don't understand. So, so the, you know, the, the, the basic story is what, that these aliens crashed here. Is it one alien or multiple aliens crashed here? The, you know, where do they crash? Is this the Roswell crash? And they were, they were taken into a military base and kept until that time. And periodically they've been interviewed and one of the interviews got out. That's the crux of the, of the story. I can, I can unpack that a little bit. Okay. Um, through anecdotal stories and a photo, we believe the first body of a being, of an extraterrestrial being happened in the 30s. Dr. Stephen Greer has this bizarre autopsy photo of a bizarre creature in military men and, 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 and uh, OSI agents, people, men in your suits standing by and taking a picture with this. The, you know, the, the holy grail of ufology was in 1947 when two craft crashed um, over the area basically of Roswell, New Mexico. Two? Um, four beings were inside the craft that crashed. Three were dead, taken to Fort Worth. One was alive, and that was taken to Los Alamos Laboratories, um, where it lived until 1951 or two. For the past 80 years, there have been numerous crash and crash retrievals. 
the crash retrieval program, there's two of them. One is called Project Pounce and one is called Project Star, S-T-A-A-R. These are the retrieval programs of special Air Force servicemen who go out um, at a moment's notice to retrieve the craft and any other occupants or pilots. And this has been going on since 1947. And uh, it's a great question. This being, we think, I cannot prove this, and I don't have any, and I don't have any evidence to prove, but this is what I've been told, that this being came from a crash in the Kalahari Desert in 1989. And Victor said that the being came to this facility in 1989. And the other being of that crash went to the super secret facility underground at Wright-Patterson, Air Force Base. And Wright-Patterson is very important because it was the material Foreign Materials Division. If they had a plash, crash plane in the 40s, it was taken there to dissect and, you know, reverse engineer, so to speak. So Wright-Pat plays a very important key to this whole thing. Uh, Matthew, we have uh, anecdotal stories where there's so many crashes and so many bodies that bodies are stored at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida, Michaels Airfield, the new home of Area 51 at the Dugway Proving Grounds, Sandia Labs at a time on the basement facility at Walter Reed Hospital, a Fort Worth uh, Army Airfield, um, of course, initially at, at the Roswald Airfield in 1947, and, uh, uh, and, and a couple of other facilities that I am not, not privy to. Um, so the, but the new high-tech area, the new Area 51 is the Dugway Proving Grounds, which is uh, part of Michael's Airfield, or Army Airfield is part of, and coincidentally, Sandia Labs has a huge facility on that, on that base also. So these things are, so there's, there's many, many crashes. I mean, NASA's got a better track record than that. I mean, you know, so I, what, what, so what is your, um, you know, based on your, you know, actual research and not just listening to Chris Marrero, which is my buddy that I have on every right. once in a while, right. um, not just believing everything you read and actually doing some research and speaking yes. with people that, you know, are in the know, what, what is the consensus of why they are coming here and what is the issue with the crashes? Great question. Um, from three people that were either in that facility dealt with the beans or were at, you know, on top level of that facility. Um, one of the reasons the government is not coming out and saying, here you go, folks, we have aliens, is even after 80 years, they're still not quite convinced of what the nature is, how many species there are. And when the government doesn't know something fully, they usually don't project that and tell the people, um, yeah, we have species of beings here and we have no idea what the real reason that they're here for. And according right. to people down there, so this is an anecdotal story, but, you know, from Victor, from Captain Dan Burrish, who was a pathologist at, at level S4, is that um, Victor believed that some of the beings um, have allowed themselves to be shot, to be acquired, to be targeted, to crash. Almost like a, and he gives the example, almost like Jesus Christ coming on to our planet, knowing that he's going to be crucified. I think that was a, a really good analogy that Victor said. And we also have developed technology, a beam-like technology uh, back in the 80s of, of, of targeting, acquiring, targeting, and um, engaging these craft and bringing them down. And um, it, the 1947, the infamous Roswell cra crash, you know, Richard Doty now tells people, and this is backed up by other people, is that the United States government, and Stephen Greer even backs this up, and, and him and Doty, you know, are, are, you know, are not, you know, on the same team, so to speak, that in 1947, the government first turned on this type of radar, was so powerful that in conjunction with an electrical storm, caused interference with these beings craft. You know, people say, well, they're 10,000 years advanced of us. You know, also to the adages, folks, I believe, and look at America and look at the world today, the more technically advanced you are, you know, the more susceptible you are to, to very minor things, you know, knocking out your entire, your entire system. I mean, look what can take down 
the world now. A, a computer bug, a, a coronal ejection from the sun can wipe out all all mankind in a matter of 90 days. So it is, you know, these beings. Um, well, I was I was actually thinking about, I mean, let, let's face it, you can have you can have all the high tech equipment you want. You can have, you know, an M16, you can have body armor, you can have like the best military uh, um, equipment. And let's face it, a, you know, an Indian with a bow and arrow, you know, may still kill you. You know, he hit, he, he fires that arrow, hits you in the right spot. You're going down. It doesn't matter that huh. you're completely draped in, you know, Kevlar, Meh. Right. you know, he hits you in the neck. You're just done. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's what 4,000 year old technology. Right. So, and, and, and Matthew, people have said, well, you know, and, and forgive me when I make fun of the internet keyboard warriors, but you know, that, you know, it's, they deserve the criticism at times for their ad hominem, hominem attacks. Well, you know, why is it stories are different? Why beings are here? Why are they some crash, some get captured, you know, some abduct people. I say that the world is like the Amazon in 1820. Did British explorers go there for science? Yes. Did British explorers go there for geography? Yes. Did British explorers go there for um, zoology and to capture all kinds of animal life and maybe tag it and analyze it? Yes. Okay. Did some people from Britain or around the world go to the Amazon in the 1800s? or recreation and vacation and adventure? Yes. Well, why are we different? I know it's an ego deflation that we are no longer sitting on top of the food chain, that these beings are on top of the food chain. You know, they're the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, and we're the deer. You know, they're tagging our ear. As people say, they got put devices in them to track them. We're extra they're extracting semen and ova from human beings like we do to animals. Sometimes the capture and tagging goes well. Sometimes it doesn't go well and people or animals die. You know, we, we're the farm, we're the wildlife now. And I know that's an ego blow, but I've come to grips with it and I can deal with it. And I think other people should too. So there's a variant, in my opinion, reason why these beings are coming here. Uh, another thing, why did we go to Egypt or Africa in, in the 1800s to mine gold and silver and precious metals. Well, why can't they? Well, you know, gold is a, an incredible astro physic, physical metal that is great for, um, you know, space travel and, and space applications. We know that from NASA. Why wouldn't they come here and, and try to mine our gold? What makes them so special and angelic? You know, um, so the reasons why they crashed, why they abduct, why they're here, I think, is, is the you know the British explorer in the in the Amazon River analogy. I think it's I think it's a perfect representation of the who and why, and and maybe nobody will ever know the full total truth. And I'm going to try and jar people here, maybe piss a, pe a couple of people off. I want to do that. I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not an interloper. Or, uh, I want to help the military come out of the closet with this. I want this to be clear because I know military people, intelligence people listen to all these podcasts. I've been told that by now 10 people. And I want to be clear. I want to jar the American public who's listening to this because this should piss you off. Scott Walter is a TV star of a show called American on Earth on the History Channel. Am I, I get, let me get back in better You've view. been slowly moving and, over, yes. Yeah, Scott is um, goes on camera about a year and a half ago say that he's really interested in the UFO phenomenon and, and like me, gets contacted by somebody in the program. And this gentleman worked at Wright Pat for the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. And he claimed that he was in the know of this alien phenomenon. Became very good friends with Scott. Scott vetted him, met with him, had dinner with him. And for nine months, Scott tried to convince this person to do an interview with me and to maybe do an interview on camera to appear on my you know, documentary if I ever one out. So he called me up and very nice young man. I, I want people to very, very nice, polite young man. And we were talking, you know, he says that the, the black strips over some of the beans uh, eyes are a biological light lens reflector. And, but he said something bizarre. He said, I'm going to tell you something. And you're probably one of the only few civilians that know this. And I'm going to tell you, tell you this now, your, your listeners now on this show. 
He told me the new designation that the United States government who deals with this phenomenon and subcontractors have for extraterrestrials. It's saber, like the sword, synthetic astrobiological extraterrestrial races. And he said, you know, no one knows that. He goes, you tell a, a, a general that you at a cocktail party in Washington that's maybe read into these programs, that an acronym, and, you know, they're going to look like they swallowed a peach pit. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, I really appreciate your trusting me with that. And, and I thank you. And he said, send me the questions for your documentary and I will submit it to my commanding officer. So I'm assuming that he's probably military. And I will get back to you. I submitted 20 questions that were very explosive, that came point blank. Does the government have, have alien bodies and craft? Do you know of that personally? Am I in trouble? Um, what is the else does the government know about aliens and extraterrestrials? He ghosts me for three months. And I'm worried because this guy's a bona fide military person in an alien program at Wright Pat. So I finally just, after three months, I, I, I texted Scott Walter. I'm like, Scott, this is crazy. I want to know, is this man alive? Is he in trouble? And I guess more importantly, am I in trouble? Am I, is my life in danger? Why would he ghost me? And about two hours later, Holden, that was his nickname, his, his name that he gave himself, which is from Catcher in the Rye, texts me back. And now it's this aggressive purse matter of fact text with all these coding he was such a gentleman it was almost like somebody from the dod or a higher up wrote this for him you put this now you send this to john stewart we're going to stop that you know we're going to stop that jerk right off we're going to cut his legs off metaphorically and it said i am been commanded by someone higher than my co to cease and desist all contact with you I am asking you, you are not to cut, drop, share this text message. You are no longer to contact me. And this should piss you off. You are now on a special government watch list due to your frequent and the nature of your FOIA requests, your overseas emails, and the nature of your questionnaire that you submitted to the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. And beneath that, is, uh, Matthew, is this bizarre, all I can say is like Department of Defense coding under regulation 227515 stroke A, uh, recopying of this text message is firmly, uh, 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 you know, you, uh, I'm mixing up the word, firmly, you know, admonished by the, uh, the United States Department of Defense, all of these anacronyms and weird letter, you know, letters jumbled together. I'm like, how am I reading? Like it came from somebody from the military. I, I called Doty two hours later, just is Doty knows all this nomenclature. Doty was livid that this guy was told to tell me I'm on a special watch list. Rick Doty, this counterintelligence guy, was like such a proponent for me. He's like, that's illegal. He goes, that's illegal. How dare they say that to you? That, that's a disgrace that the military would tell an American citizen that they're on some kind of special watch list. You know, it's the first time I ever angered or saw this mild-mannered Richard Doty get completely, you know, come out, come on, totally unglued. And, and I'm asking the American people, do you feel a little bothered that a 56-year-old grandfather who's just trying to find the truth about a film that they accidentally let out 25 years ago that I'm putting on a special watch list? It's crazy. We live in a constitutional republic. I don't live in Stalingrad in 1943, and I certainly don't live in Berlin in 1944. Um that was really troublesome. And, and the fact that this man was told to ghost me. Um, and I initially thought he was David Grush. Um, but I was told by Scott that he is not the David Grush that came forward. Um, but that, that was, that was really troubling. That was really the only time in this investigation where I was truly upset and worried and, and pissed off. And, and I think people out there listening, they should be equally bothered by someone from the Pentagon telling me you're on a special watch list, you know, Come on, it's, I even get just I even get distressed as re relating the story again. Um, so, but that was it. That's the you know, that's really the investigation in a nutshell. What did you think about the congressional uh, hearings yesterday? 
it, was it a hearing? Is that what it was? Or oh yeah, it was a hearing. Committee? It, it was hearing. a hearing by the United States Congress to clear the air and come clean with the American people about the UFO, UAP, alien phenomenon. And was, 27 times in the hearings, it was said, wait, uh, what was that? Yeah, I can't it was talk. the same thing. It was just the same thing over and same, over. Like, same, they basically same. took the same interviews that they've been having, and they just got them all together in the same room. Right. We want to come clean. We want the American people to trust the government. So that's why we're letting 37 times say, I can't tell you that right now, Congressman. I have to tell you in private. Uh, I can only tell you that Congresswoman is skiff, a secure room. I can only tell you that off camera. I can show you the documents, but I can't tell you. I mean, that, that was supposed to make everyone believe that Congress is coming clean. Stop mocking our citizenship and belittling us. Please don't. Have them in private. Don't have people come out and say in front of the American people, I can't talk about that. I'll tell you in private. Wink. You know, give me a break. Okay. So that's a, you weren't happy with that. Um, what no. do you, I have a question for you. What do you think about the, uh, the Navy footage of the TikTok videos of the TikTok uh, UFOs? I think that because there was no rivets, there was no propulsion system in back or wings, um, you know, even though the government has reproduct reproduction, uh, alien craft, you know, you still see rivets, you still see seams, you still see some sort of pulse propulsion in the back. Um, that the fact that these TikToks were defying gravity uh, and upwards of 60,000 feet in one second did not have any seams or visible propulsion, that that was indeed um, a craft from an exotic or you know, unknown origin. Uh, and what David Grush was choking on his words on News Nation is, is the fact that some of these beings and craft, folks, as crazy as this sounds, are interdimensional. Let me give you an anecdotal story. I'm at a coffee shop. I'm being shown these photos of these beans. I said, what is P55,000? What's P42,000? We have 42,000 aliens? And the military person says, no, that's that's not how many we have. P42,000 means that's a being from 42,000 years into the human lineage future. I'm like, can you, un you know, can you unpack that for me? And I know you was unpack a lot. <laughs> can you explain that? He's like, John, aliens are not from our human lineage. They're from other galaxies, other planets, other star systems. When we call beings ETs, those are beings from the human lineage. Now, human lineage also is has been transplanted on other solar systems and, and star systems and whatnot. And also these beings, some of them are interdimensional. And this is being proven that travel interdimensionally um, is possible, is theoretically possible. So when this person was telling me that I'm looking at a photo of a being from 42,000 years into our future, you know, very disconcerting. <laughs> it was mind boggling <laughs> to me. Um, the the information that, I, that I've been Starbucks? given. You know, it was a coffee shop. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say the name. It was a coffee shop okay. in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love meeting witnesses at, at coffee shops and restaurants. I, I love eating, as people can tell with my double chin. <laughs> and it, uh, Matthew, it breaks down the, it helps the, with the, the, the breakdown of formality and, and trust and whatnot. You can, they can see how I treat a waitress. I can see how they treat a waitress. I can see their eyes, um, you know, and when they're eating or drinking a cup of coffee, um, you know, you can really wade somebody and, and do the sniff test and, and tell if they're telling you the truth or not. So yeah, I love meeting people at, uh, at restaurants and coffee shops and, and diners and stuff. Okay. So do you, you know, it's funny, the alien autopsy uh, yeah. video. I remember yeah. the girl I was dating when that came out, she ordered it for me. That was like one of my Christmas presents. I remember I had, I actually had that on VHS, Right. you know, so, um, can I, can I just say one thing about that? Sure. You know, first it's real. Now it's a hoax. Then it's real. I just want to tell people and show you my investigative prowess. I'm not bragging. I'm just something to think about two broke financially broke uh, men in England put together that film. Okay, great. It was shot on 1947 Kodak film stock. 
16 millimeter. And can someone explain how two broke people in London rented a World War II era hangar, uh, air, 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 uh, uh, air Force hangar, rented five Jeeps, made six bodies of aliens, had 15 people in period 1940s army attire and military police attire, along with six stretchers, and filmed that production on, for the last five seconds of the alien autopsy. Don't believe me. I want your viewers to tell me if, if they, the alien autopsy is a total hoax. How could two people, again, it's just like my film. How can two broke guys, financially broke guys in London, have a $40,000 production where they're renting an airplane hangar with beans on stretchers and people in period clothes? Does that make any sense to anyone? Well, so and I to don't build know one of those things. about the alien autopsy, but I know about the last five seconds. And if you're going to tell me that that isn't a real shot from the 40s of five uh, extraterrestrial humanoid looking beings being laid on the ground in front of an air force, a hangar. Um, sorry, sorry. I'm not, yeah, I was going to say, I even to totally be able real. to, to be able to, um, create, uh, the aliens, like that's just not average. You, the average person doesn't have that equipment in their base you know, in their, you know, in their garage. Right. Like, I mean, it takes, right. you have to pay somebody serious right. money to come up with those types of things. Right. Uh, so, Okay. Are, is there anything else that we haven't gone over that you'd like to go over? I just, you know, I, I just want to say in a recap, uh, thank you sincerely for having me on your program. Um, I, I thank you to your listeners. You know, I know at times I seem exuberant and people said I, <laughs> I have crazy eyes at times. Hey, look, I'm excited that after five years, I'm done with this investigation that I think that I proved a really important um, cover up in human history. I'm excited that I can finally spend quality time with my wife and and my daughters, and I'm excited to bring it to you. So I, I'm sorry for exuberance. And then people have said, well, he 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 talks like he's been debriefed by the government. I have been debriefed by the government. I I, I you know remember military intelligence insiders retired came to me and debriefed me read me into these programs and this program so we can be clear the overall program to study all things aliens and the phenomenon from 1947 is majestic the program at this facility where this film was was shot is called project aquarius and that is all things with aliens the back engineering reverse engineering of of craft uh the examination of biological tissue the examination of beings what they say what the, or what they thought project and, and their propulsion, their guidance systems, their life support systems, so on and so forth. That is called Project Aquarius. And so, you know, take this, you know, listen to the anecdotal stories. Don't so much focus on the film. Although when you do focus on it, zoom in. This creature has shows emotion at the end. He almost looks exasperated when they're wiping the fluid from his mouth and his lower lip does a, you know, a, a curved down arch. Um that had to be hard animatronically to do back then and to do it instantaneously. And I offer people, do your own homework, do your own research. I, I sincerely thank you for listening uh, to me. And we will solve this situation and this phenomenon. I truly think that this is going to bring the American people together. Um, and, and if you want to use this as a TikTok clip, then let me say this. And I'm going to, I'm going to speak very clearly and not mince my words. I'm going to tell you something right now. When the underserved and the minority communities of this country finally start paying attention to the congressional hearings and realizing that $8 trillion of their money, money that could have been used for homeschooling, daycare, recreation centers, college education, uh, transportation uh, for single mothers and the elderly, um, uh, help with help with medicine, intuition. When the underserved of this country, and I'm one of them, gets wind and starts paying attention that their government pilfered away eight trillion dollars to study tissue of aliens and reproduce alien craft, you are going to see some sort of a bloodless revolution take place 
in this country. And I want to tell the congressmen and subcontractors who have been lying about this. When that happens, they're not coming to my house. They're going to come to yours. And you remember what I'm saying here. And I am not threatening anyone. I am warning people in the government. Let's come clean now. Let's avoid the revolt. Thank you. All right. I um, I was gonna I was gonna say something that had kind of come out where it was like the 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 idea of the shadow government or the shadow kind of that shadow uh, body of the government that is hiding these things or you know um, which which is always funny to me that the Pentagon you know lose every you know is always missing billions of dollars every year you know that always kills me like where does that money go it's like okay well then these 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 things have to be funded where's the money coming from well i mean the government is the absolute worst with money they're constantly losing money oh. and that and I, and I, and i disagree because he, he, here here's why i know you know where that money is because i have a friend that deposited two um, you know, the COVID, the relief checks, sure. he had, he, he had somebody who came to him and gave him two fake 1200, or I think it might be three, three fake $1,200 COVID checks. Okay. He deposited them in his bank account. They cleared, of course, because they were government checks. Now they were fake. They were, right. you know, they were counterfeit. He got the money and within a year people from the government showed up and wanted to know that they knew exactly where the money had gone, that he'd gotten it tracked it down. You're going to, you're going to spend probably 20, $30,000 on an investigation, another $50,000 for an investigation and to keep house him in jail for $3,600. You spent almost $100,000 to track down $3,600, which you'll probably never get back. But right. you don't know where a billion dollars went. Right. That went to the Pentagon. Yeah. That no, is all they, electronic. They didn't right. bring it no, in. No, no, Matthew, they don't, they can't, they, they can't, they don't know where it went. It's just, you know. Yeah, that. I, that we don't know on. what happened to $3 trillion. We're sorry. You know. Like, even if you were to say, hey, you know what? We cashed it all out and we used it as bribes. Well, then say that. We, right. For other countries, we needed these people to vote this way right. um, on these committees in their country so we could get a base right. here. Oh, I'm good with that. Yeah, me you too. bribed some people in right. in India to get a base or to get a, a contract. I'm OK with that. Right. To, right. Tell me. Exactly. It's Donald Rumsfeld. You know, a day before 9-11, the government, the Pentagon can't account for some three trillion dollars. And a plane hits the Pentagon exactly in the accounting room where this counting error occurred. Hmm. No suspicion on that. Don't worry about it. Let's move on. Let's see what's on Wheel of Fortune tonight. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a joke. It's an insult. It's part of the, 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 what propelled me to keep going when people laughed at me and, 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 and people were ghosting me and maligning me. Um, you know, uh, it, if we can't have financial accountability to the people that pay the bills, you and I, you know, and that's another thing that one military intelligence insider told me. He's like, John Stewart owns S4. You know, Matthew Cox owns part of that B-52. We own the building. We own the chairs Congress sits on. You work for us. It's not a right. cliche. You work for us. I go out and work my butt off in the automobile industry and in real estate and the stock market to pay taxes to pay for all of this. You work for me, you know, and, um, and, and, and now in a real, you know, the Pentagon smart. Now it's been said that all of this material, biological and in, in craft and metals is all with private contractors and corporations. Why? Because you can't FOIA them. I they was have say a right not... to privacy. Yeah. So the generals are like, we're done. Oh, it's, in, it's in with my buddies. And when I retire, I'm going to go work for EG&G, uh, uh, Raytheon and Boeing. And I have no problem with that. I have no problem with, you know, somebody going to get a job that, you know, uh, at EG&G uh, or, or uh, Raytheon when they were. A, I have no problem with that. But let's keep everything on the up and up. And now now let's come out and tell the people about this. But 
All of it's with corporations. You can't FOIA. Well done, boys. Well done. Got to hand it to you. Listen, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you contacting me. And I'm assuming at some point during this uh, during this uh, post or this video that Colby will play the uh, the autopsy, the video. It may be at the end of the video. It may be during the video. I'm not sure where uh, he'll uh, he'll play it, but um, he can I zoom up would... on the photo at the end when the doctors come in. Oh my God, it's it's jaw dropping to see the emotion, the facial expressions, the eye socket changing shape, the mouth opening, closing instantaneously. It's amazing. Well, send me the link if you can. I will. We'll I will. And I'm going to send you the, the superimposition, the x-ray view where you see the pupils of the eyeballs behind the black eyes. I will, when I get done with this and get out of this cramped podcast room, I will, uh, I will send you, I will send email you the links. We'll do. Hey, this is Matt Cox. I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor. Join my Patreon. It's $10 a month. That's really nothing. I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, if you if you like the video, share it. Uh, also, subscribe. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Leave some comments in the comments section. I'm sure John will be perusing it. And I'm sure uh, you guys can have a, a lively discussion and we're going to be on with Chris Marrero. We're going to be talking about a variety of things spanning from Bigfoot to aliens to the moon landing, which Chris has a, a whole conspiracy thing on the moon landing. And we're going to be talking about the aliens that landed in Las Vegas because I get aliens like gambling too, I guess. So... We don't know. I don't know. We're going to find it, but we're going to check it out. It's going to be great. Check this video out. Okay. So what are we going to talk about? Well, you want to start off with Bigfoot. So we're going to go in, dude, I'm going to go into Bigfoot and then dog man and wolf man and lizard people. And then dude, you wouldn't believe what's happening in the national forests. It's unbelievable. I love it. People are missing and going missing and never being found. Like, for example, you and, and your wife could be walking on a trail and you could disappear. And it's like you were just here a minute ago and now you're gone, never to be seen again. I'll, I'll tell you some stories. It's crazy. Um, yeah, as I was studying some Bigfoot stuff, um, the biggest uh, I mean, there's so many people that have seen Bigfoot or or in Florida skunk ape, you know, since we're in global. <laughs> oh, okay. They call them skunk ape because they smell so bad. Why don't why don't they ever have their their iPhones with them? Like I I I don't I don't go from one room of my house to the other room without without my iPhone. But on the forest, it's, you don't always get a signal. I guess you know. I mean, you're out in the national forest or whatever. Um, but one of the one of the guys who does uh, about the missing four one one is a guy named David Politis. He's a former police officer. And he's noted anywhere from 1,600 to 2,000 people that are missing in the forest. They're just never seen again. Just gone. Maybe they get lost. Huh? Maybe they're lost. Maybe they get lost. And then yeah, they go, believe me, he's a cop. He goes through all the, all the different sections of what could have been. Could have been a, an attack. Could have been a suicide. Could have been they got lost. Could have been they just got hurt. And then there's a whole section of people that just vanish disappear out of thin air and it's crazy but let me go fat real quick with with um this crazy with uh, uh bigfoot i was i was listening to some of the stuff he was talking about and he was uh because they have found hairs you know on, on different trees and things like that and they try to get them to a um a person who does dna testing and what they found out through micro mono run chondrial tests uh you the medulla in the bigfoot is useless they need the actual follicle and they found out that they're not neanderthals they're not deno venesians they are another form of homo sapien is that bizarre so hair, hairy people they yeah when they're doing the hair they they um to determine it, there's no other entity that has this kind of hair. So she has to create a method to unlock 
the testing for the DNA that she created, because they didn't even have it for this, this, well, I don't want to say animal. She's saying it's it, uh, another form of homo, homo, homo sapien, that the hairs were absolutely unique. Um, they're they're a modern human and they have developed within the last fifteen thousand years. Go figure that one. So because of something called Gendak, you can know where the male comes from and where the female comes from. For example, you know, if you do ancestry.com, you can see where your, you know, relatives came from from, you know, Europe or Russia or whatever they came from. Your father yeah. came your, your mother came from there. But the lineage uh, with this, the sample of the lineage of the mother, they can find, but they cannot trace the lineage of the father from the DNA that has that they they can't they can't trace it for whatever reason. It's very strange, um, and all the tests come back from from different tests as human, but not but a very very unique human. So. And they also fi fi have found out that they can cloak themselves and they can shapeshift. They can disappear. <laughs> but they're, ha they're super hairy. Oh, super hairy, super massive, you know, eight, nine feet tall. All right, what about, is it possible that they're Italian? <laughs> Italians are very hairy. And they smell bad, real bad. So if you ever go uh, in, in the Italian. woods... I'm half Italian. <laughs> You're not hairy. And if you ever go in the woods, if you suddenly hear everything go quiet, like the crickets stop, the frogs stop, the birds stop chirping, you know they're nearby. You're in trouble. So that, like, that's, that's like that's the <laughs> Even Teddy Roosevelt, they said, had an encounter with uh, with the way back when. They also said it's better if you're on horseback. If you're on horseback, uh, you got to get the human odor off the ground and you'll have more of a contact with them if you're on horseback well i'm i'm never in you're not going to believe this i know you look at me and you think woodsy <laughs> this is a guy that hangs out in the woods but i really don't a I, I honestly, kind of guy i honestly never leave the house we're we're in florida <laughs> and i don't like walking to the car <laughs> in the driveway so, yeah, so I'm not going to be in the woods. You would never go out in the woods? The only way I would ever see one of these is if somebody had their iPhone with them and captured it, like, on camera, you know, on the camera, because I'm not going out, out in the woods. Well, they've caught a few on camera. One was the Fat Patterson film uh, back in, I think it was 60-something. But they, they um, that was one of the most famous actual getting a, uh, a Bigfoot on camera. It was a Patterson, Patterson Gillen uh, actual photographs that they that they got, but I want to get also to the uh, you got to have David Pilatus on your show, man. If you can get him, he's really great. He has a um, his uh, website is canammissing.com, meaning Canadian America. Canam is David Pilatus, P A U L I D E S, and he's written several books, one of them being Missing 411. And um, he's a uh, He's got so many people. Let me, let me just do here. And this is the, the National Forest guy that Yosemite's does. the worst. He says Yosemite's the worst. Yellowstone, Yosemite. You go in there, yeah. go camping, and and what? What does he think? Something you think he thinks Bigfoot's grabbing him? No, <clears throat> no, not at all. There'd be a hustle and, and noise and screaming if that was ha the case. But no, Bigfoot's not taking him. I'll give me an example. There was a, one called Stacy Aris. 30 years ago, Yosemite. She went, she was on horse, she was horseback riding, got off, went to walk down to a, a boulder trail to take some pictures and disappeared. Never been seen since. 30 years maybe, ago. Maybe it was there's like a well, like one of those little. <laughs> no, <well>. no. <laughs> So what, so what does he think happens? They don't just disappear. You got to realize there are search and rescue guys into the hundreds that, that are searching everywhere. And what's bizarre is places that they have already searched and gone over several times, they suddenly come back and there's the body sometimes. What happened to them? They don't know. Well, they don't they've got to have a pathologist that goes in there and cuts them up. 
Yeah, but the person says they that they just died, and they've been, been gone for could be several days, weeks. And sometimes weird, really weird, is that the weather changes automatically. The me- the weather will rain hard for like three days, or will snow really hard for like three four days. That 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 really hinders the rescue missions. It's really bizarre. Get a load of this. This was uh, February seventh, two thousand eighteen. Danny Filipides, 49, a Toronto fire captain, 28 years on the force. He's at a place called Whiteface Ski Resort in Lake Placid, New York, about 40 miles south of the Canadian border. He was with a group of guys on vacation when one of his friends got tired, but Danny said, you know, I want to take one last run. So he goes and he disappears. Six days they do searches for him for six days. His car's still in the parking lot. They figure he still has, he has to be on the mountain. So days go by. And a week later, he calls his wife from Sacramento, California with a head injury. And he doesn't know how he got there. (laughs) He was in New York. Ended up in California. That sounds like fire in the sky. Did you ever see that movie based on those guys? The law. Travis Walton. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's interesting because they've never, like, their stories have never wavered 30 years old, later, 40 years later. They're like, never, tr- never wanted anything for it. Never. Yep. Guy still works in the same industry. Like, it's like any of the benefits he could have had from lying about that or the group of them lying about it. What benefit was there? He was mocked the rest of his life. He worked in the same field, never tried to make any money off it. Yeah. Just, there's no benefit. So, there's no benefit. So it's like some people it's like, okay, well, they're trying to cash in like Bob Lazar really cashed in, you know, <clears throat> he, if he was making up, if Bob Lazar was making up all of his stuff. Oh, well, he's yeah, been he, through some shit too. Well, I know what I'm saying. At least he can say, I made a career of this bullshit. All right. So, but this, uh, but these, uh, these other guys, the guys, um, which is Travis, like there was no benefit. Like those guys were mocked the rest of their life. Like they, they didn't want anything to do with it. Some of them moved away. They went to different industries. They denied it. And Travis Walton was missing, I think it was for five days. And during that time, the cops did a whole search in the, in the area that he was uh, supposedly missing. And after those, like, I think like three days, because they kept asking the guys, that, you know, come on, what'd you do they with them? They killed him. Yeah. And they wanted to arrest them. And so they, they, were, they did um, lie detector tests. They all came through with, with flying colors. But they still wanted to arrest them and and put them in prison for it. And then also, you know, Walton shows up five six days later. Says, "Hey, here I am." <laughs> well, he he showed up naked. Yeah, in the middle of the night. Like it's not like he, he showed naked. up like, "Hey, I just like, gosh, where am I?" No, he showed up like traumatized. He's naked. Calls a fucking payphone. Hadn't eaten in like five days and had a growth beard. He didn't know he was he was gone five days. Yeah, that's a good story. That's a good. Yeah. But anyway. So you anyway, were, this you were, guy, the guy with the head guy, injury. Yeah. He says he has a slight memory, he, uh, a slight memory of being dropped by a trucker at Sacramento airport with a new haircut. The whole, what the if whole the trucker time. picked him up, did things to him <laughs> and gave him a haircut? Cause he also like, liked to cut hair. Maybe he was suppressing like maybe his father wanted him to be a trucker. He wanted to be a hairdresser. Every once in a while, he picked up some guy, he knocks him out, gives him a good haircut, and drops him off along his route. <laughs> but he has no memory of anything. He called the sheriff, and they take picture of him still wearing the ski outfit he had and the helmet. Well, the trucker didn't have a change of clothes for him. No, but I'm saying he has no memory of anything. The next he hit was- him in the, the trucker might have hit him in the head. <laughs> That's possible. I'm just saying there's an explanation to that. From the ski slope? I'm saying the trucker was driving by. He saw this guy. He thought, hey, that guy needs the haircut. I've always wanted to be, you know, like a, a, I always wanted to be like a, whatever, a hairdresser. He hits him in the head to knock him out, cuts his hair, and then keeps going on his route and drops him off like in Seattle or wherever he is. And so all he remembers is I was on the ski slope. I got hit in the head. I woke up in fucking Seattle with this haircut. Crazy is that? Like, <laughs> how do you? How do you? We gotta find this trucker. 
get a load of this one. This guy, and I don't remember the guy's name, he goes uh, by himself to go hiking in the woods during the winter time. There, you know, the snow is on. He just wants to go out get get some peace of mind. And he goes out, and eventually they find his tracks end where he was walking in the snow. You know, there's nowhere to go. You know, your tracks there, and it's gone. He's disappeared. 18 months later, he's found, he finds himself in a cornfield in Kansas with new shoes, sneakers, new backpack, and he has no memory of anything. Where he's so, been? Okay. Nothing. Nothing. If he was, if like a spaceship picked him up, I get that. But typically the spaceships, when they pick these guys up and, you know, they do stuff to them, they don't usually give them a new backpack and shoes. <laughs> well, it's a consolation prize. Look, I know that you've been gone six months. We probably disrupted your life, but we have some Nikes <laughs> and, and a new, a new, and a really cool backpack like that. I, that one, that's new. I've never heard that. It's, I swear to God, I'm not lying to you. This is, this is true. They already had a funeral for him and everything. He calls his grandmother or whatever and then tells them, hey, I'm alive. Come pick me up. And he didn't think he was gone any time either. He was gone 18 months. Using forgeries and bogus identities, Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the Housing Pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story, available now on Amazon and Audible. Another one is Dr. Uh, Jonathan Torges Torgeson. Wait a, minute. Wait a minute, Chris, can you move the camera down so that I can, because you're you're basically, I'm getting your forehead. That's all I... That's the most? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, okay. Mm. That's the best. Um, I'll try to look up here yeah. like this. That's fine. Um, Dr. Jonathan Torgeson, physician from Montana, Whitefish, Montana. This was February 18th, uh, 2018. White Fish Mountain Ski Area, also 40 miles south of the Canadian uh, border. He went skiing, he had an avalanche beacon, his cell phone, he never came home. Multiple counties searched for him. They went to where his phone last pinged and nothing. He was a physician who was uh, of high intelligence, high, inte high, inte high intellect, which disappeared more, which happens a lot. They say that he's saying that the people that disappear the most are people who are of a high intellect or have a disability that nobody so knew about. Safe. So like, you're safe. Like diabetes or something like that. So you, this will never happen to you. <laughs> or I need to work. Really I, need to look, I need to look out. This is really bizarre. Ready for this? Yes. Or they're of German descent. Okay. I'm 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 Nordic. I'm from Norway. So I'm once again, well, you're close by. I'm close, but <laughs> I'm okay. I dodged the bullet there. You're you're Italian and and what? I'm half Italian, half Cuban. Oh yeah, but my grandmother was German. The next one is Ryan Schutka, employee of of a ski resort called Sun Peaks. He was at an end of the season party, walking home from the party down to the street, and disappears. Gone. No one's seen from him since. Multiple search parties, hundreds of people, no evidence he left the village. And that's it. No one no one knows anything. He's gone forever. And these are, he's never showed back up? Never. 
Okay, listen, we're we're not in the forest though anymore. Are we still in the national forest? Yeah, you're still in the national forest. These are like um you know, like cabins and things like that that they have there that they might have a party and he goes home or whatever. Okay. Another one is Thomas Malarkey, Bear Valley, California. He was an electrician. He was an advanced skier, had a cabin nearby with his wife. They had, again, an army of search teams were grounded because it was snowing so hard. 35 inches of snow fell in 72 hours, which is a lot for that area. And they never found him. Gone. Missing. Just evaporated. There's no clothing. There's no boots. There's no nothing. There's no city kidnapping. He could have just taken off. Listen to this. Listen to this. The dogs can't even track a scent. The dogs go and then they come back and they lay down. They can't even, even <laughs> these are dogs who are used to it. They love it. They love the hunt. They can't even get a scent. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, that doesn't, these guys could have taken off. That guy could have taken off on the, on the wife. You know, it's the ones that come back to say there are three states away that go, I have no idea. Those are the All ones right. that are, those are crazy. All right, well, let me give you this one. How about the ones that are two-year-old children that disappear and they end up 10 miles away on the top of a mountain and they can't explain it? Well, who finds them they on the find top of the mountain? Child. They find the child, but it's like several days later. He's fine, but he's on top of a mountain 10 miles away. A two-year-old can't do that. Well, who, who, who's on top of the mountain to find them? Well, the search teams. Search teams go all over the place. <laughs> okay. They, they don't fuck around. There's some great sites, uh, YouTube uh, things you, you should go see if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, what Lurks Beneath is a good show. Uh, Donovan Dread is another one. Coast to Coast. With George Norrie. Have you heard of those? Coast to coast, yeah, of course. A- and um, the uh, um, What Lurks Underneath or by, something like that. What Lurks Beneath? That sounds familiar. Yeah, I gave that to you a long time ago. I don't know if you went to see it yet. <laughs> I, I watch about one out of every, every uh, probably one out of every two or three that you send me. Sometimes you'll send them to me like three times, four times. I'm like, he sent this one to me twice. Did you see the one I sent you uh, today? The the one with the big, they were like, they were big, tall people, Bigfoot, hairy. Yeah, but one of them was uh, one of the dog man, the wolf man, that they, I think they shot it. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, no, I did. I saw that. There was no sound. That could be the dog. Yeah, but look at the body. So, hold on. Look at the body. It's right. going to show the legs and the ass in a minute. Look, that's a human, dude. And another one is uh, U-A-M-N. TV, Cosmic okay. Agency. Cosmic Agency is great. Cosmic Agency is run by uh, his YouTube channel by a, a woman named Gosha, and she's been interviewing the Palladians. The Gosha. Gosha. She's from Poland. You know her, right? No, no. No? Poland, no. Oh, I thought you knew her. I thought you, you tried to get me to interview somebody that was a woman that was like no. a Sovereign citizen or something? or That was Sharon. That was Sharon. Okay. Why didn't you ever call her? I don't know. Because honestly, I'm, I'm not even supposed to be really interviewing anybody that's not directly involved in either um, like law enforcement, like cr- criminal cases or something to do with true crime. Like I, I'm my booking agent, I'm always telling him, he's always trying to get me to interview uh, other people. And I'm always like, no, bro, I'm just doing true crime. Just true crime. But, you know, you're different. you you're I, I you're you're a crossover because you you are a criminal. <laughs> That's why your whole I'm innocent thing. So what else do you want to know? What about so what about okay so that was you know we never even t- I never even asked about about um national forest abductions or disappearances. I thought we were going to talk about uh, aliens. What's going on with the the um. What's going on with the Las Vegas thing? Well, so far that as far as I know that you know the last thing was uh I think the last thing I sent you was that they had uh it on video from a security camera. Did you see that one? Well, 
Yeah, but they also have the body cam from the police officer where they, and it, that could be a, um, you know, that could just be a, uh, like a, a, a falling star. What do they call them? Falling star. Falling star. What do you know? That could have just been anything, an astral comet, comet whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It could, that could be anything that they saw that it's the, the kids in the back of the house who say they saw these things, which of course, once again, you know, I, I keep saying, well, they don't have, they didn't have a cell phone. They couldn't. And of course everybody's like, they're like 12 or 13 year old boys. Like, no, they don't have a cell phone. They're, you know, they're Mexican kids in, you know, that went in the backyard. They didn't have their phone. They don't have a, you're 12, 13 years old. You don't necessarily have a, a cell phone. So I get that. But I was wondering if anything else has been heard or come out in the community. Cause I know you're a part of the, I know you're a part of the, the inner circle in the yeah but not not from vegas no nothing has happened that i know of yet okay. um have you ever heard of uh, what happened in brazil no Parisian Bra- Bra- it's called uh Parisian brazil or whatever it is moment of contact that was the actual documentary by jamie oh. fox no no I, jamie who what yeah it's not the same jamie fox it's the oh. different jamie fox um where this uh, UFO crashed, and it's the same kind of situation. Uh, there were two aliens that were actually walking through, t- were going around town. And uh, these three girls actually saw one of them actually against like a wall, and they were terrified. They didn't know what the hell it was. They thought it was a demon because they're, you know, Catholic, and they thought it was a demon. And, uh, this thing was actually telepathically telling them, you know, I'm, I'm kind of scared. I'm, I'm hurt, you know, and, and he didn't know what to do. And the other alien was actually captured by uh, the, the military guys, which just happened to be driving by in a truck and they stop. They actually tackle this thing, bring it into the car, take it to the hospital. Right. <laughs> For some reason, I see the Brazilian cops trying to put handcuffs on him, beating him while screaming. <laughs> Stop resisting! Stop resisting! But okay, but so they so they get them, and the cop that actually um, uh, grabbed the alien uh, died for a month later from whatever the alien had uh, on its skin, uh, some sort of whatever lick, you know, some sort of something that it didn't react very well to his skin, and it killed him. He was dead in about thirty days. But it's a very interesting story if you haven't heard of it yet. It's called Moment of Contact. It's really what happened good. to the alien? Uh, they they both died. Both of them died. So the uh, and then how many aliens were there? Two. Two. Okay. Thought you said three. And, okay. and the government quickly jumped on anybody who was involved with it, and just you know, to, you know, like they usually do. They want to suppress everything. And then, of course, the American government came in and swooped up and took everything else that was uh, available. So this happened back, uh, I think it was the mid-90s. And uh, we're just getting the information of it now. But, I mean, that was that's quite a story, dude. It was quite a story. Um, I would like to hear the rest of Las Vegas. I really would. So what do you think about this? What do you and John think about all this stuff? I was telling you this in prison. You don't believe any of it. I, I... The, the, listen, the whistleblower guy has me kind of like, well, first of all, when, when, when look, cause my whole thing is why aren't there any photos? How come there's no proof? How there's come nobody gets photos? There's so much information. It's overwhelming. I understand what I'm playing with. I'm saying now with all of the, you know, uh, um, available camera systems and video and record you know that there should be something and so when when it came out that those pilots from the um the the navy pilots came out and they started throwing all that footage out like hey we got them here we got them here we got them here we've been getting them we've just been told not to say anything like right. when all that came out i started going holy shit this is nuts and then this whistleblower comes and says look he's got all this evidence he's like but let's face it i don't want to give it up i don't want to be um Edward, you know, Snowden, I don't want to have to be living in Siberia Russia. or hiding in Russia or, or, you know, so he, they went and they gave it, he gave it, he gave it to Congress and said, here is what is out there. So, you know, I'm curious to know where that goes. 
Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm 90% there, but I'm also somebody who was raised in the eighties and nineties where it was, it was ludicrous to, to believe that aliens existed. So I still have that kind of 10% of me that says, don't go all in. Gotcha. Like I'm not necessarily Joe Rogan. Who's 100% all in <laughs> absolutely there. I mean, I believe, I'm not saying I don't believe in aliens. Obviously I believe that there's life, you know, throughout the universe. I mean, mathematically, there's no way that there's not billions of, of uh, planets with life on them. My problem is, why would you come here? You know what I'm saying? And if you could travel across the entire, you know, galaxy and come to Earth and then crash, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, ooh, like the brakes went out, like, come on, stop. So, I'm just curious, like, why here? What are you interested in? Why would there be any interaction? You know, like those are that's where where the conspiracy theories start to get me going. Okay, look, you had me at they're here and they're observing, but then suddenly, no, no, they've taken over. They're working in conjunction with us. They well, what do they even need us for? They want the planet. Well, let's face it. They if they're so technology, so hybridization program. A what? A hybridization program that they're doing to to uh, hype to hibernate yeah, or no, they're taking part of our gen that's why they're abducting people is to get their their dna we don't think they yeah. would have that licked <laughs> evidently <laughs> not <laughs> they, plus have you heard of the people that have been tagged no so if, wait first tell me why aliens are here so what what is this one why are they here specifically They've been here for thousands of years before we were here. I mean, they've been here way before. I mean, for na for example, the Anunnaki supposedly came here 450,000 years ago from planet Nubiru because they needed gold for their planet's atmosphere. So the Ajiji, who were their so-called slaves to be able to dig the gold out of the ground, were doing the gold digging for about 10,000 years, and finally they said, forget it. We, we're, we don't want to do this anymore. And what they did was they combined their DNA with the bipedal hominids that were here to create mankind. And this is not me. This is according to the clay tablets of the Sumerian text. It's not me saying it. So this is before the Bible. So this is the the foundation to what later became the Bible. You know what I mean? So they created man and man, according to divine encounters, which was written by Zechariah Sitchin, the original slaves were the African people who, who they have found these huge holes all around Africa where they, they think the digging was actually happening. Um, by machine, by not just humans, but by machines and, and, and space things or whatever, you know, spaceships or whatever. They're all over South Africa and Africa. They're, they're massive holes. Michael Tellinger has found them everywhere. And, um, but they've been here before we were here and they're still here now. They're supposedly under the water in the oceans. They're supposedly in Antarctica. Oh, you got to hear about Admiral Bird. You know about Admiral? Wait a second. Listen, my <laughs> we'll talk about Admiral Byrd in a minute. Listen, that's a whole show in itself. Go Let, ahead. If these things had the ability to travel here, right? Like you you got to be able to pa travel at least the speed of light. No, he needs a wormhole. Okay, to be able to let's say navigate a wormhole and get here and get back. So where this wormhole is, I don't know. Or create a wormhole in order to make that happen as if that's even possible, which maybe it is. I don't know. Um, if you were able to do that, why would you need humans to be slaves? Wouldn't you have robots? I mean, let's face it. In 10 years from now, we're probably going to have robots on Mars building huts for us. So wouldn't they already have like androids and robots? Why would they even need us? Because their civilization is dying because of their th their genetics. I don't know why, but they are doing a hybridization uh, to create a better um, entity, if you will. You know, because they're, yeah, a better us in a way. Because 
they're they can't reproduce apparently from what i understand mm. what about cialis <laughs> i have a prescription i got a doctor she's just write it just she'll write it you say i'm i'm having issues i'm 53 years old i need you but i got you uh 53 years <laughs> well what's funny is you know um i'm talking about gosha again um she has uh that the cosmic agency these palladians they're they live to be 900 50 to 1200 years old but they all look like they're like 12 13 14 17 years old it's crazy you ought to see them they're on i, I could give you a website if you want but. <laughs> well i i gotta yeah i gotta talk to uh i, I definitely have to talked to your friend who is at coleman who i don't know the, the woman you told me oh about. sharon sharon yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, um, out. oh yeah i know i know have him on the show He's not going to. I already asked him. He's not going to do it. He wants he to won't. do it. Huh? He wants to do it. No, he doesn't. I no? asked. Oh, that's why. You know why? Because his uh, counselor said that he can't have contact with anybody who was, you know. A yeah, I, I understand. But if you're that, that's different. If, if you're doing it for, you can't really stop someone from talking to press. And you can't really, and, and if it has anything to do with business, you really can't stop them either. Like it was work related. I'm doing it to promote myself. I'm doing it to, I mean, look, you, you see me, I'm on federal probation. So am I still. My probation officer is like, eh, you know, whatever. This is what you're doing for a living. That's fine. And I got a, a, a reduction. Did you see that? I sent it to you. That what? I got a reduction. Did you see that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. For yeah. the um, first chance act, right? Yeah, I'm I'm getting uh, like a year and a half off on the ankle monitor. Right, that's for what? It, didn't Trump sign that in? Uh no, I got good credits. I got good time, good credits. No, I'm saying the First Chance Act. I think uh, Trump signed it into law. But that's what I got out on the CARES Act or Trump. Yeah, First Step Act or whatever it was. One of those acts. <laughs> you have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> no, the credits. My God! One is the COVID. What you got off on the COVID thing. The second Wait. one is the first. You're getting the credits for the First Chance Act, which Trump signed into law. So whenever I talk to Pete, I always tell him when he's like, "Yeah, I just got my first credit act. I'm going to be in halfway house in a month." I'm like, "Well, you better thank Trump." And you know he's super liberal. Like he's like, <laughs> he gets all upset. I'm like, I'm just saying you uh, you got a, almost a year off because of Trump. You remember Trump, don't you? Yeah, all right, all right, whatever. That that law, they were putting that into place before Trump ever got... Yeah, so Trump signed it. Trump, so you need to write that man a letter. And <laughs> so oh. upset. <laughs> How about Levinson? How about Red Bull? What, is he out? No, I mean... Oh, he's, 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 been out? he's a bad inmate, bro. He's gambling, he's going to the shoe... He's selling pills. Really? Yeah, you kill it. He's a maniac. He, and he's he's gonna get out. He's gonna be a probably be a multi multi millionaire again. He, he's a hell of a salesman. Oh, I bet. No. He's one of those guys that's like, you know, like if he could make three million dollars a year legally, but he could make three and a half illegally, he'll go with the three and a half. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, I thought I'd be all right. I thought, yeah, he's a, he's a slippery character, but he's fun. He's and he, he's and he's great. He's hilarious. I love him. <laughs> I would hang out with him all the time. I wouldn't invest with him. No, no. But still, yeah, I do like him. Can't trust him with anything. <laughs> no, no. Don't lend him money. Don't. You're not getting your money, but you know, if you keep, I'm very good at compartmentalizing people. Like this is the person I like to go to, to have fun. Oh, great. What if he needed to borrow money? No, no, we don't lend him money. Now this person's boring, but you can lend this person money. So, um, <laughs> oh, so, so what about the Admiral that went, was what'd you say his name was Admiral 
Admiral Richard Byrd. Berg? With a Bird. B U B Y R D. Bird. Oh, okay. Bird. He's extremely famous. Um, Richard, he had uh, the Medal of Honor. This guy was serious. Uh, you, he went. What year? What year? Roughly. 1940s. Okay. He, uh, he went to, uh, under o- o- Operation High Jump, he went to, uh, Antarctica. And this is 1946 uh, 47. 13 ships, 4,000 personnel, and they were attacked by flying discs <laughs> made by Germany. <laughs> Hitler. And what happened was he took one, one of the before that actually happened, he took a uh, just a regular plane just to fly over and see what's up. And he uh, he goes over these mountains and suddenly the discs take over his airplane. They take over the, the steering, the, the pedals, everything. And a voice comes through and says, we've got control of your ship. Don't worry. We're going to take you to where we are. And he, as they're taking him, he sees a mammoth on the ground. They're supposed to be extinct. A mammoth. It keeps flying. And they take him to the hollow earth. What is considered, what we, you know, I don't know if you believe in the hollow earth, but... This was uh, actually found in his diaries, and um, the they thought oh, he thought you know he was introduced to a whole city down there, in the center of the earth, and <laughs> it's crazy, man. I, I'm telling you, it's called Agatha, and the people of Agatha were warning him to stop the atomic bomb weapon uh, detonations that we were doing. So they gave him some messages to take back to the leaders of, you know, our leaders. And um, he did. But they said, keep it hush. Don't tell anybody. Don't talk about it. Don't nothing. But the way this information got out was when he died, he had written a diary and he gave it to his son and his son then published it. So he didn't ever, ever intend to have it published. Yeah, but that whole uh, that whole nuclear weapons thing that worked out. Like, there haven't been any problems. Um, actually, there's supposedly a rift that has gone through time and gone through the whole. Uh, and that's why we had so many uh, alien encounters because it's affected their dimension or whatever it is. Uh, the whole nuclear atomic bomb blast that we've done. We've done more than two, of course. From our, her, her own, Ah, Nagasaki, Nagasaki in Hiroshima. We've done more by practicing and, you know, you know, the whole, uh, the Bikini Islands are destroyed, you know, in all that area. Yeah. They wiped those people. They, they, they didn't, they didn't wipe them out, but they definitely gave them some sun damage. The reason I would love for you to have Billy Carson on is because he just did a documentary called uh, the Black Knight Satellite. Do you know about the Black Knight Satellite? No. It's a satellite that's been circling the Earth for the last 13,000 years that was put there by aliens. Nobody nobody really knows who, but it was put there to kind of like just keep an eye on Earth. So he did a whole uh, documentary on it. He's really good. Billy Carson, he's on YouTube. He's, he's got Forbidden Knowledge TV and a whole bit of stuff. So yeah, The problem is the, a- the, the alien people, everyone I ever watch, like they try and do it like they're doctors or something. Like they right. sit around... They try to do it super professional. It's like, stop it. You don't have to do that. What's happening? What, what, what's happening with the economy? What, what are they going for with it? What is Biden doing? Is he in, he's in coots with the aliens? What's happening? Well, supposedly the, the, the actual hierarchy goes from, cause I mean, they got to think about it. The president's only a temporary employee. He doesn't really control anything. It's a deep state that really controls everything. And they're still controlled by, Europe, you know, there are three three uh, city states. There's the Vatican, there's the city of London, and there's Washington D.C. And Washington D.C. is not part of the United States as a separate entity in and of itself. It's ten square miles of Washington. It's not the United States of America. 
the it's the United States. Yeah. yeah, but it's the United States and the United States of America, two separate corporations. Okay. So anyway, it's controlled by the city of London and the Vatican. Now, Karen Hudis, who was a, uh, a whistleblower lawyer from the IMF, um, stated that everyone who pays taxes, the taxes go, because the IRS is a collection arm for the Fed, right? The taxes go from the IRS to the Fed, and it goes to England, where England takes a 40% cut, and the Vatican takes a 60% cut. So... She's saying that, not me. Karen Hudas. You can look her up on YouTube. H U D A S. Karen. Um, and the ones above the Vatican, supposedly, are the reptilians. And above the reptilians is the Galactic Federation, which you would learn if you watch Gosha's uh, YouTube channel because they talk about it there. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic con man against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. So... There you have it, big guy. <laughs> okay, so I don't understand. So what? Are, what's the goal? What, why? Why is the economy not doing well? Well, the is economy's it? not doing well because Trump's not in, in power. I mean, what? Biden's trying to do everything to screw this up, you know. And 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 uh, the BRICS are going to take over, which is you know was uh, it's China, Russia, uh, Brazil. The other countries, they want to get rid of the, the uh, United States currency as the predominant currency. They want to get re do a global currency reset. And be and once that happens, we are become a third world nation like ASAP. Because the dollar is not backed by anything, as you know. It's backed by our, our, our labor, basically. There is no gold that backs the U.S. dollar. You're aware of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nixon took us off the gold standard. 1971. We are the gold lars. So listen, what are we talking about with I, wh what happened? Listen, I, I gotta get, we gotta get to this. The moon landing. We landed in what? 1969? Mm-hmm. Supposedly, yes. But according to um, the astronauts, uh, there were entities there waiting for them. There were uh, all, I mean, all on a rift and everything. There was a whole bunch of UFOs and everything that were, that were there. It, it kind of terrified them in a way, supposedly. So, I mean, if you notice their actual uh, conference when they came back, they were not happy. They, did you ever see the conference they gave? No. They were, not, they were not men who were, you know, elated by the fact they were the first ones on the moon. They were um, quite subdued. And kind of, they kind of look sad and depressed. And even Stephen Greer later wanted to get a, a some sort of comment from Armstrong about what happened up there. And he said, "I can't talk about anything because they will come after me, my kids, my my wife, everything. They'll they'll make us disappear. And and I can't have that. That's why Armstrong never gave any interviews or anything. Um, Buzz Aldrin, on the other hand, he had um he had you know." He didn't really care. I mean, he was uh, he wanted to, to get the information out. 
and and they have found all kinds of man they found all kinds of stuff on the far side of the moon um supposedly the moon was actually put into place like like towed into place and put there um that's why it doesn't rotate if you know the ro- the the moon does not rotate we see the same face of the moon all around it's all um what do they call that locked it's uh... yeah and it's hollow and it's hollow the, the NASA actually hit it with something and it and it rang like a bell. So the damn thing is hollow. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it is. I'll I'll send I'll send you the stuff. Look <laughs> listen. What? what about okay, so do you remember telling me about it rang like a bell for three hours? <laughs> do you remember telling me about the um uh, the Soviet Union had gone to the moon, and it, w- they got there, and they warned they were they found an area or something. They warned the Americans not to go in that area. It's probably on the far side of the moon because the far side has uh like buildings and things like that th- that have been that are that are there, and they were probably warned not to come back either. I mean, there uh, there was a guy named Michael Price who was a remote viewer, and they asked him. Oh, Ingo Swan. I'm sorry, Ingo Swan uh, did a remote viewing. You know where what remote viewing is, right? Yeah. And um, he did it on the moon, and when he got there, he saw what was going on, and the alien, whatever the aliens, whatever that were there, recognized him, recognized that he was there. And the CIA, he, he was working for at the time, said, come back, hurry up, come back, come back, don't worry about it, come back. And he came back, but there were entities up there. And also, the secret space program is is, is a trip, man. You ought to study Corey Good, and her name is Eisenhower. The the, the granddaughter of uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a part of the, sp- the, the secret space program. They were on Mars already. They've been on the moon already before the landing that we know of. I just heard about this two days ago and I've never heard about it before. This is the newest conspiracy that I've just heard about. Ready for this? Okay. And I have a video on it. I could show it to you. (laughs) Well, it must be true. It's on the internet. (laughs) The challenger, when it exploded was empty. They did it as a, as a trauma based thing, a psyops to get trauma to all Americans. The an- the uh, astronauts were not there. They were actors. They were not there. They are still alive today. They were, they were, they were in small crisis actors. What? What are they in the witness protection program? What, what, what Similar to it, yeah. Similar to it. And they've discovered um, all of them. The, some some are public. Some are teaching it at, at like Yale and and, and stuff. The Rud, Rud was in a Resnick. She was one of the there. And uh, what's her, the other one? McCullough, who Christy McCullough changed her first name is now something else McCullough, but she um, she's also a teacher somewhere. But they they're still alive. It's crazy. I never heard of that one till now. That's that, that does sound crazy. That does sound crazy. <laughs> it is. It sounds nuts, but man, I got some other stuff I would love to show you, but I, you know, I can't get it to you. I don't, I can't get it from, uh, where is it at? It's on Telegram, I think. You don't, you're not on Telegram, are you? I mean, I think I have the app, but I never use it. Like I'm not speaking, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, not the CIA or anything. I don't, don't need Telegram, but, um, I, so I have a question. Did you ever hear that the Nazis had gone to the moon? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You think that's true? They had like a, a secret base. They had a secret base or something that Bon, what's the name? Uh, bon Werner Braun. Von Braun. Yeah. Werner, Werner von Braun. Von Braun. Braun. Warner Von Braun. He was Warner head von of the, uh, right. yeah, the whole rocket uh, space program in NASA. And what is that one? What is what one? What's the theory there? And do you believe it? Um, the theory is that they had an actual Roswell situation way back before we did, way, way back in the early 30s. And the aliens were giving them instructions on how to build certain items and how to build and, and do all kinds of stuff. And when you listen to it and you actually digest the information, yeah, you, you kind of think 
it, it, yeah, it can happen. Yeah, for sure. Do you believe it or no? I don't know. No, I don't, I don't believe it, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a, a standard. I believe what, what's in the textbooks. It got um, very much the point where they, um, they were using, basically they were taught how to use submarines in space. Like you could take a submarine just like you do in the ocean, convert it to the fact that you can put it in space. Right. And use it in space. And you could go for, you know, months and months, you know. And they had a, they built a, a base on a the moon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. Sounds crazy. Where'd you hear that from? It wasn't for oh, me. I, I, oh, I've heard that. I mean, plus, you know, there was that, um, there's a movie that's based on that. Yeah. It's called, uh, Iron Sky. Okay. Yeah. A documentary. You would think it's a documentary, but it's actually a fiction movie. It's great. I, I, I gotta watch it. Um but yeah. You have to look up also Operation Blue Beam. Blue Beam, what's that? Operation Blue Beam is now they got enough meridium in, in the sky that they can uh, project things in the sky and to make it look so real that we are, let's say, being uh, invaded by aliens. But we're not. It's actually projection, but it looks so real that people won't know the difference. It's Operation Blue Beam. And what what is this? Palladium? What is it that's in the sky? It's from uh, when they do, um, uh, whatchamacallit, the stuff they put in the sky, the airplanes put in the sky. Oh, the, the, the chemtrails? Yeah, the chemtrails. All right, so listen, you're not a great storyteller. So this, the, so you believe that the government is pumping what chemical? Barium barium into the atmosphere through planes so that they can project well it's included with the other chemicals that are involved i mean the other chemicals are, are there to you know cloud out the sky and the sun and, and make us sick and a whole bunch of other stuff but they include barium in that and then with that they can project things into the sky that people you look like it up what? now. Look it up on your, your Google. Look it up. Uh, look up Operation Blue Beam. Yeah, I, I understand, but I, 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 if I wanted to do that, I wouldn't need to talk to you. <laughs> so, what are they? What are they? What is the? What are their plans to project what? Well, according to uh, Werner von Braun, he said the first thing was going to be wars. Okay, we have had the wars. We were going to have the last. One of the last thing was the war against terror. Right. Then there were going to be meteorites. And then the last card was that they were going to use was the alien invasion card. And that was just to, can you, to continue the fear, uh, you know, that people would have and just keep them in fear. And, and they would have to need more money, of course, from Congress because they're not having an, an alien invasion and they need more money for more. You know how the military industrial complex works, and you'll always need money for more weapons and more this and more that. So, so that's, that's the purpose for it keep people in fear, get more money from Congress. And who said this? Warner von Braun. Warner von Braun on his death. There, on on his death. death. Yeah. So he said that the long term plan is to <laughs> continually have different types of wars, and eventually the last one they would do would be. A war against aliens, aliens, which could go on forever, which is in fact untrue because the aliens have been here. Yeah, it's untrue, totally untrue. But most people don't believe in this stuff. You know, they don't. They think it's hokey or bullshit or whatever. So they're gonna. They haven't educated themselves enough to know that the aliens have been here for thousands of years. They're not antagonistic. They're they got technology that's a million years ahead of us. So I mean, they've wanted to take us over. They could easily. Just with their mind power alone. Their mind power is incredible. <laughs> so there wow. you go, big guy. Well. You okay. should really... I would love for you to get Billy Carson on there, Stephen Greer. You'd love it. it it'd be a whole world that... that they, but they I, can just... I can barely run this little channel. I can't do a whole. I tried to do another one. This is a pain in the ass getting people to to do. Actually, with Streamyard, I'd probably just just do this. 
and just mash out videos of just, you know, insane uh, uh, topics. Because some of these topics are just outrageous. Like, you know, they're so conflicting. Well, David Pilatus, David Pilatus is, is a former policeman and he's trying to find all these missing people. He's got like 2,000 cases of, you know, just the national parks. You could have him. That's true crime in itself, in a way. I know. I mean, he may be a former policeman. That doesn't necessarily make him credible. Uh, how many po former policemen did you meet in Coleman? Well, he is credible. <laughs> what about <laughs> uh, what happened to Justin? Remember Justin, the guy that stuck the broom handle in the in the guy's. Uh... Remember that guy, Justin? Yeah. He was in yeah. prison, got thirty years for violating the guy with the broom handle he wasn't he was incredible nice guy i like justin that just let him out recently i mean nice guy but then he didn't do anything to me so you know i can say so how do you correlate that to mr politis i'm saying that you, you're <laughs> saying he's a former policeman and that makes him credible i'm saying all right well read his books he's got his books out he's got books out he's got a documentary out why don't you have a book out i don't care for it for what what am i gonna write about what am i you got all kinds of stuff you could write about. You could try and formulate I've a screenplays. I've written like 13 screenplays. You got to do a YouTube. We got to get you on your feet, bro. Yeah. Well, that's not going to happen for another year because I, I got to get this thing off my ankle. I'm yeah, but we got, yeah, you, you can't go back to your old line of work, filing <laughs> taxes and do whatever you were legal, the legal things that you did that got you into jail. Like you keep it uh, legal, but they blocked you up. All I did was telemarketing for them. I, that was my part. That was my role. And that's in my I know ID thing. That was my role. The jury didn't believe it. Oh, juries can be manipulated. Are you kidding? But I got amazing Brady violations now against the whole court system and everything. I mean, it, it'll, it'll, yeah, it's bad for them. What, the, what, what, what other stories do we have here? We've gone over with any other. So you have. So what what is the ultimate goal for the aliens to work with the Earthlings? Like, what what is their ultimate goal? Right now, it's hybridization. There are aliens among us now that we don't even know that they're among us. They can shape shift to the point they look exactly like us, and you never know. Um, sometimes you can tell because their eyes shift. You know, they're shifting eyes. Uh, from we have like round pupils, but they have the slit like a snake, you know. So sometimes that happens and they can't control it, but they they they're there. <laughs> they are there. So what? Oh my god! So what? Um, I was just thinking I'm gonna get B-roll of like a snake eye and throw it on there, <laughs> throw it on their thing. So what? What's their ultimate goal? You're saying just to breed themselves into uh the the human population uh, right now. Yeah. yeah. And slowly take it over through the hybridization process. And they're willing yeah. to, they've been slowly manipulating this thing for the last how many years? Oh, years, many, many years, more than, more than our decade, uh, our century. That's for sure. But also they're doing, uh, they're tagging us. Did you know that there's a guy named Dr. Lear who recently just died, but he was, um, he could, um, they're, they're, patients that he had that came in and he would do an x-ray on them and he could find where the person had a tag and the person never had any operation before and they know that they had been abducted you know like years later years earlier and uh he had he would do surgery to get this little you know alien tag out of their hand or out of their leg or whatever it was you know they do that too it's it's uh to find they're, out where they're you... little tiny I, i've seen this they they look like um it's a meteorite they look, look like little tiny like a fuse but it's tiny right yeah kind of kind of that kind of that shape it's got elongated kind of little shape mm -hmm. i've seen yeah. that i saw one where they got it and it, when they tried to open it up it just it kind of like self-destructed it just went it's like burned up like a little fuzzy little and then it was just kind of <laughs> ash right i mean that that's i mean I mean, I'm not saying I've seen this. I've seen this like on a video or somebody explained it to me. I didn't see it. I wasn't there. He has uh, 
It's on YouTube. He's got some stuff on YouTube that some people put out on him. You could see him do operations where he takes it out of people's legs and hands and arms and things like that. His name is Dr. Lear. Okay. So, so how's married life? It's good. It's the same. Nothing's changed. Like, I don't, you know, the biggest issue for me with married life is that I now have to say wife instead of girlfriend. And I'm usually mm-hmm. saying girlfriend and which I don't think is that big of a deal. But whenever my, my wife is in the room and I say, yeah, my girlfriend, she gives me this look and I'm like, what, what? And she's like, I'm your wife. Like, okay, it was, you know, it's the same thing. No, it's not totally different. It's like, oh, hey. So yeah, it's an issue. the title and inheritance is different. It, <laughs> well, there's nothing to inherit. So, well, she's got that foam wall behind you. And she hasn't taken she hasn't taken my last name, so oh no, no, no credit cards have changed. Nothing's changed. There's no driver's license. There's no chain. Oh. So I think she we're still feeling it out. Like maybe this might not take. What are you doing now? I'm working telemarketing room again. It's the only place oh. to hire you with an ankle monitor. It's crazy. Everyone there is suspect got a suspect, uh, you know, alter life that they've had in the past, so they don't yeah. care. Did you tell them that like it is your like isn't that why you went to jail last time for telemarketing? Yeah, they don't care. They don't care. Don't what, you your probation don't... officer doesn't care? No. It's crazy. What are you selling? Right now it's uh, MACs, which is the merchant uh uh cash advanced debt settlements. Merchant cash advanced debt settlements. If you have you're a business owner and you've taken a cash advance based on your receivables. Mm-hmm. these are like loan sharks and they loan you like 40 to 50, 60 percent on those receivables that, you know, the money that they've loaned you and you have to pay that back daily or weekly. So we help them to settle that for 50 percent because it's it costs too much money for the business owners It's usually choking. them, Right. So you guys go in and you say, and they say, Hey, I owe $10,000 and you go in and you try and negotiate it down to $5,000. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's basically it, but it's more money than that. It's usually 30,000 and above. You're right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just an example. And we go in with a bunch, let's say they got 30 cases. The attorney will go in with 30 cases and, tr- you know, to the same lender and say, look, these are all going to go bad. So you're going to have to take uh, a 50% cut on these because they're either going to lose either way. You're going to lose everything if you don't. And that's what I'm doing now. And I- <laughs> any other, any other alien stories? No. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. Sure. There are a lot. I can't remember them all. There's so many. There's so many. Well, I'd love to come up and do the show right there at your, uh, in my living room. There. Yeah. Yeah, it looks very professional on, you've seen it on TV. And I got rid of, I had a bunch of Marilyn Monroe, like some of my paintings on the wall. I got rid of that. Now it's just a red wall. So it's a lot more cleaner. Although I don't think anybody even notices that stuff. I notice it. Why'd you get rid of the pictures though? I like those. I did like them. But first of all, like I, I wasn't really, they weren't really selling. Like I wasn't selling a bunch of them. And so, you know, it, it would be easier for me to just plug in an ad about paintings than it would be for me to keep them on the wall. Like, you know, there's this whole story behind her that she didn't commit suicide. She was murdered. Right. Because of a, a job. Uh, didn't she have an, a, what was it? What was the story? All right. The story I know the story, is... but I don't want to tell you the story because then you'll go, uh huh, uh huh. And then I'm telling the story instead of you <laughs> telling the story. So what is the story? I know it is. I know what it is, but go ahead. Okay. She was good. At, she was, um, because, uh, Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy weren't really answering her phone calls. She, uh, John yeah. Kennedy had told her that Roswell was for real. Wait, stop. And you got to start at the beginning. She was one. She was having an affair with JFK. So start with that. Well, you're bad at this. Well, I'm not used to being on <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> yeah, she was having an affair with JFK and a, also a, an affair with Robert. And, um, they were kind of like, I don't know, they, they weren't answering her calls as fast as I guess most women would like someone to answer their calls. So she was getting kind of angry and um, 
what happened was that during one of the pillow talk times, I guess they were together, Ro- Roswell came up and he had told her that it was a real deal. And he had seen uh, the alien uh, bodies or whatever the craft. And um, she was going to have a press conference. And the CIA got wind of the fact that she was going to have a press conference. And um, the guy who was running the CIA at the time, his name was Angler. And Angler uh, got Sam Giancana to actually go in and actually murder her with, uh, it was some dip, uh, suppository or something, something like that. So she never committed suicide. Right. Who was uh, um, who was that? He was a mobster or? Just Sam Giancana? Yeah, yeah. He's huge, huge mobster. Yeah. Okay. You should know that name. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I don't do a lot with a, with mobsters, but I, that did sound like I was thinking that I think he was a mobster. He was yeah. uh, involved with like uh, Kennedy's father or Kennedy, supposedly. Well, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy was, uh, they, they actually, uh, John Kennedy was helped by the mob huge with the Teamsters to vote for the Kennedys to get into office. Right. right, and then he kind of butt double crossed them, right? Exactly. With and Robert came at them really hard, you know, and he was sick of it. So he double crosses the mobsters, which is a big no no. He's going, um, he's asking from Magic, you know, you know, Majestic Twelve. They're they're the ones that were controlling the whole UFO stuff and everything. He wanted all the information. 12 days before he got assassinated, he wanted all the information on his desk about NJ-12, Roswell, you know, everything they had on it. And that wasn't going to happen in the 60s. And um, that was another reason he got assassinated. Another reason was that he was going to break up the CIA and, um, and create the DIA. And then another reason was that he had created, um, he was going to get rid of Federal Reserve notes and he had already create, uh, created uh, 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 United States notes. And they weren't going to have that either. So the reserve was basically controlled by the Vatican, and they weren't going to have that. So there were multiple reasons why he got assassinated. And um, so that was it. Oh, you want to hear something else? Yeah. This is an exclusive for the Matt Cox podcast. Okay. All right. Yeah. You're going to have to do Google, Google it. Right now? It'll, well, no. You can do it later. All right. It'll over this. All right. You know, you know the dollar bill on the back of the dollar bill, the pyramid, right? Correct? And then the capstone, the top of it is cut off. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's the eye, right? Correct. Now, if you do an aerial photograph, Google it of Dealey Plaza, you will see that it's a pyramid and the top is cut off by the railroad tracks cutting across it. And there's no way Oswald could have orchestrated that. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. It's a pyramid. When he takes, when they take that left turn, it goes down a, 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 an angle and it goes like a pyramid. Do an aerial photo. Go to Google, put in aerial photograph of Dealey Plaza, and you'll see it looks like a pyramid with the top cut off. With the because the railroad tracks go along the top and it cuts off right there. There you go, Matt Cox. You have an exclusive. I'm what does sure. that mean, though? I don't understand what that means. Freemasonry. So the Freemasons. Yeah, they're all Freemasons. Okay, so you understand that that Daily Plaza Dealey. was Dealey, sorry, that Dealey Plaza was built probably ten or twenty years before the assassination. That's not the point. The point is Masons okay. built it probably most likely, correct? Freemasons are in the government high up, like George Bush. I don't see how that had so so they built this place it, it, uh 20 years ago saying if we ever need to assassinate a president here's where we'll do it i don't know but it it's 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 built just like a pyramid if you look at it 
Well, I'm sure lots of things are built in in the shape of a, a pyramid. Well, you know, in Washington, D.C., the whole uh, part of Washington, there's a whole part that's uh, built like an owl. And their owl that they have at the Bohemian Grove is an owl. That that the 45-foot uh, thing they call a Moloch, the, where they do the cremation of care. I don't know any of this. Yeah, I know. you got to learn all this stuff, dude. you got time to learn it. I feel like, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but I don't need to know this stuff because <laughs> I don't feel like this is going to help me in any way other than it adds for a good show entertainment value. And I don't, yeah. And there's a little owl emblem on the $1 bill on the front on the one where the one is it's on the corner. Yet yeah, I'd have to show it to you. You can't see it right now. So, I have a question. Why are we going to Mars? Why does Elon Musk want to go to Mars so bad? And why does the government want to go to Mars so bad? Well, they, like they, they feel they want to get, you know, off the planet because it's too crowded. And then they, they just, I don't know. They just want to get off. I have no idea. That's what they keep saying that this world is going to be coming to an end soon, you know, because of pole shifts or whatever it might be. Who's that? Who's that? that? What the pole shifts? No, I'm saying Elon Musk just said he wants us to be an interplanetary species. Yeah, that's what something goes wrong. But I've heard of other people say that you know the reason that they want to get off is because there's going to be a pole shift, and when that occurs, there's going to be massive destruction on the planet, catastrophic. That it's going to be very hard. Just now, I don't know if you've heard, Yellowstone is is they <laughs> think that thing might blow up soon too. Yellowstone uh, National Park, you know, the bubbling, you know, the how the bubbling yeah. comes up. And, uh, yeah, old, if uh, thing, old. If that thing blows, we'll be under a, a, an atmospheric darkness for many, many, many years to come. It's going to be a mess. There'll be no sunlight. I mean, every, they, we'll have a frigid winter for sure because it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a mess. But well, if, I mean, you well, add a pole okay. shift, if you add a pole shift and we... You're supposed to have a pole shift every, I think it's 330,000 years. We're at 660,000 years. We're that much behind. We should have it any minute, but, you know, once that happens, it's going to be a mess. Well, what is the pole shift? I don't even know what that means. It means when there's a pole shift, you're right, you have the North Pole, the South Pole, and if they right. shift, if they shift, you have, let's say, Antarctica now becomes tropic. You know, Florida becomes, one, you know, freezing cold. And um, everything shifts. And, and and what happens is we are traveling at 1,000 miles per hour, roughly. So if that stops, the, the wind and, and water continues to go. It doesn't stop. So we're going to have 1,000-mile winds and, and water that's going to take over everything. It's crazy. I mean, it's going to be a mess. And, and they feel it'll happen soon. Look up. Y-Files did a, did a great show on it. Who's they? What do you mean they? You keep saying they think it's going to happen soon. Who's they? Scientists who study this stuff. <laughs> you laugh, but you laughed about UFOs in prison. I too. did laugh about UFOs. <laughs> Nobody's more upset about that than me. <laughs> everything I know, everything I tell you sounds nuts and crazy, but it's all truth. I mean, I'm, I'm not making it up. I can't. There's no way. So... Do you believe in global warming? Uh, no, I believe in, in stuff that's worse than global warming, like pole shift. And if there's pole shift, there's crustal displacement. So let's say, for example, an orange. Think, think of an orange, right? You have an orange, and you have the crust of the orange. So let's say the orange, the top and bottom, is sits straight, but the crust is turning. I mean, plate tectonics. I know what plate tectonics are. Okay, that would be a disaster. That would be well, a disaster. You're just going to explain te plate tectonics to me like I don't know? Well, I don't know if you know or not. I don't know if you know. <laughs> There's some just fundamental knowledge that people have. I mean, just because I don't know about the aliens doesn't mean that I don't understand basic scientific principles. Anyway. Well, you know you don't know about the Bohemian Grove, you said, right? And the Moloch and, and, and the owl. and no, but They didn't teach that in science class. 
So, so you think so when the polls shift, if they shift, you're saying if they do this, we would still be spinning, spinning, and we would also still be near the equator. So I don't think they'd be that much of a big deal unless it happen really quick. It is. It happens it's very quick. You have to hold on to something because the mammoth that, lover, the mammoths that they found in Antarctica still were chewing their food when it happened. They hadn't even swallowed yet. That happened that fast. Go ahead, laugh. <laughs> I, I don't. I. You have to do a YouTube channel. You really do. You could just. You could just reach in and just. Every, you could just do a different episode. You could do a 15 minute episode twice a week and, you know, you'd be able to quit your job in, in a year. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, it'd blow up. It'd be huge. You let me edit the videos. We'll put little, we'll put, listen, when I do, when I do these videos, I'm going to throw some aliens and stuff in there. I'm going to have some spaceships and you're going to say when the, well, listen, when the, when you, you're going to say, well, when they, when the reptilians come down and I'm going to have a little spaceship go. <laughs> 